You're watching BCTV. We're all about Brentford. You're watching BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. This program is brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. We'll call this meeting of the Brantford Planning and Zoning Commission to order. It's uh, Thursday, July 25th. This is a special meeting. I'll introduce members of the commission and staff. To my far right, we have Commission Member John Lust next to John, Commission Member Joe Chadwick next to Joe, Commission Member Joe Viozo, Viozo turning the corner, Commission Member Fred Russo next to Fred, Commission Member Paul Higgins. To my left, Commission Member Marcy Pelusi. Our staff this evening, we have with us Assistant Planner Rich Stecker next to Rich is our attorney Danielle Burkery. Next to Danielle is our town planner Harry Smith. And next to Harry is our town attorney, Bill Anaskovich. And in the corner is our clerk recording secretary, Michelle Martin. I'm Chuck Anders, chair. We have a couple of public hearings, but uh, first item on our agenda is an executive session. An executive session to discuss the lawsuit, Housing Authority of the Town of Brantford and Beacon Communities, Inc. versus Town of Brantford Planning and Zoning Commission. So uh, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session to discuss this pending litigation with uh, members, uh, the, the people attending will be members, except I believe Joe Chadwick, you're gonna recuse yourself from this. Is that correct, Joe? Okay. And then along with the commission members, we'll invite our staff, Rich Stecker and Harry Smith and our attorneys, Danielle Burkery and Bill Anaskovich. Is there a motion to that effect? Motion by Joe, is there a second? Second, second by John, further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Chuck, you pick somebody who's gonna be the fifth, if, if uh, Joe's recusing himself, you need to. Uh, well, we're what not we're gonna, gonna vote, vote. Okay. so we're, we're okay. just gonna go. So we'll go in the other room, so you guys don't have to leave. Uh, you, you can stick around and we'll move. So we'll take a recess. <laughs> Okay, we'll call this meeting back to order. Um, we have completed our executive session. Uh, just note for the record that uh, no action was taken, no votes were taken, so we'll proceed with our agenda. And we have uh, two public hearings uh, on our agenda here. We'll follow our normal format for public hearings. The applicant will go forward, make its presentation. After the applicant uh, makes his presentation, we have a summary of the staff report and open it up for questions from the commission. At that point, we open up to the public. Please state your name for the record and present your comments. After that, we allow the applicant to respond to any of the public comments. We may or may not uh, complete the public hearing this evening. We Sometimes we continue them. With that, uh, both of the public hearings scheduled for this evening are continued public hearings. So uh, uh, the first one is a zoning regulation amendment for the addition of a new accessory use to a farm use of non-agricultural farm events. And we opened our public hearing in our last meeting. And uh, is the applicant, uh, Mr. Beatty, you ready to proceed? I am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Beatty for the applicant, 705 uh, Boston Post Road in Guilford. Um, following the meeting on uh, July 11th, I met with uh, Town Planner Smith to discuss some of the technical modifications that he had brought up at the meeting. And uh, I attempted to incorporate most of them into the uh, 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 um, uh, application and I sent that to Mr. Smith uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, there were some substantive changes that I would like to go over with the commission. Uh, one of the items that was discussed at, uh, at last uh, two week, the meeting two weeks ago was kind of the mechanism of how to oversee the use of the property with regard to the size of events, the number of events and things of that nature. We had put in our original amendment a maximum of 190 guests at one event and 20 events per year. Um, and that's an option that is still obviously, along with other options, that's in front of the commission. Following the, uh, the meeting with Mr. Smith, um, I had an opportunity to look at the amendments that were recently adopted by the town of North Brantford with regard to a similar type of what we're calling non-agricultural farm events on the site. 
And I wanted to share that with the commission tonight as another option that you may wish to consider in terms of oversight and regulation of the types of activities that would be at a site should you can, can, uh, consider, should you ad adopt this amendment. And so I brought copies of that amendment with me that I'd like to pass out to the members if that's okay. Sure. And, and the part that, that kind of um, that seemed to make a lot of sense to me uh, and that I put before the commission for it to consider is, uh, and I circled it in, on the first page of the uh, amendment, and this is what was ultimately adopted up in North Brantford, was that they, they had a, an idea of a general event operating plan that would be submitted with the special exception application that would identify how the events that were anticipated to be held on the property would be managed. And that plan would be reviewed by the police department, the fire department, the health director to say that for events of certain sizes, this is what the plan would be on, that, on the property for those types of events. Um, and the idea behind it is, if you recall in the amendment that I presented, that I initially submitted was a limited number in, uh, of events, a limited number of people, uh, and then um, that there would be an operating manager to come and talk to the town each year with regard to how the events were going to be held and that type of thing. So it placed uh, an <coughs> ongoing obligation on both staff to review it and the, and the property owner to come in each year and say this is what we're doing this year and kind of chart out what was going to happen. The North Brantford um, uh, plan says come up with a general plan and if, if it's if you're doing, if you're operating within that plan, there's no number of, of event, there's no limit to the events or size because you've demonstrated that the property can handle an event of, that you've got a plan for an event of 50 people, let's say, or an event of 100 people, or 150, or over 150. So you've identified the needs of the property and whether or not it can accommodate events of that size without c creating an, uh, you know, a burden you know, an excessive burden on the fire department, the police department, the health, the health department, and that the property itself can sustain that type of event. Um, so, so that I just throw that uh, at that option before the commission as a way to, in the context of the special exception application, the applicant would then present to you a plan that's already been reviewed by your various health, fire, police departments to say we've reviewed it and we think that we could live with these types of events at this facility for this size. So it would, it would be more site specific than a general 120 or 190 max, 20 event max throughout the region. So it's just, I th again, I throw that out there as an option <coughs> for you to consider as a way to um, give more flexibility both to the town and to the applicant to, to craft a plan that is specific for that property that would then be reviewed by town officials and then could be adopted as, as the plan for this site. The, the section three that, and the first page that I circled also said that an increase of not more than 20% would be something that would be, a view, be reviewable by the zoning enforcement officer. And if you went beyond 20% in terms of the capacity of the events that you've uh, pr pr provided a plan for, then you'd need to come back before this commission to request a modification of the special exception permit. Again, I just throw that out there as an option to, to tackle something that we had talked about two weeks ago as to what's the real, what are the logistics in terms of how you come up with this type of oversight that the town would want to have to make sure you're doing what you said you could do and that the property can support, the property and the town uh, uh, service agencies are, are comfortable with that type of use at that scale. For the property. So I just wanted to share that with the commission as something to think about. Our preference would be to incorporate this into the amendment rather than what we uh, demonstrated last time because I think it, for the reasons I said, I think it gives greater flexibility to both the town because you can review it within the context of a special exception plan 
and we will have gone to the, um, the, the various town agencies prior to submitting that application to say this has been reviewed by the various town agencies and they're comfortable with this type of use on this site. Um, the other uh, substantive uh, uh, change that was proposed was my clients wanted to extend the hours for outdoor amplified music to 10 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays where it had been 9 p.m. Uh, and 9 p.m. on Sundays where it had been 8 p.m. with a corresponding uh, closing time, so to speak, of the event uh, of 11 o'clock on Fridays and Saturdays and 10 p.m. on Sundays. So I just wanted to point those out to you, uh, that those are more of the substantive changes, at least in terms of the nuts and bolts type of things. That, uh, well, that one question on those yeah. hours. I yeah. think my, my recollection of the history of this is that there were some objections for the initial time, and then that was ironed out. Um, Correct. And was it ironed out by virtue of the the original times that you said that you now want to expand or I, I don't think it and I, I just want to confirm this with my clients but my recollection was it wasn't so much the hours it was the noise. it was the noise it was the, the types of events that they'd be having there and the location of where you were having it right okay which again would be part of the plan that would be presented in the context of a special exception permit showing the location of the facilities where we'd be hosting the events and that type of thing. So that, that and that was Audra Nuzzo, my client who was speaking just to identify her for sure. the record. And that's okay. So that's really all I had. I, I, I spoke briefly with Mr. Smith earlier this evening and I, he may have had some changes to what I had sent to him, but I haven't seen them yet, so I don't know what they Great. are. Great. So I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that the commission members Any have. questions for Mr. Beauty at this time? Great. Um, Harry, uh, any comments? Uh... Sure. Uh, before I start, I just want to make sure everyone does have a copy of the, uh, the new uh, version of the application with essentially cross outs and underlines in sort of track change format from Word. So you should have something like this. Right. And it should have a gray stripe on the right side. I think Did Michelle it? left it. No, she left it in front of your place. Um, here. Oh, it's, there's a cover letter. Right. It's yes, got an email on top? Okay, I didn't right. remember the, where the email went. Sorry. <laughs> So just make sure that's there. Um, I'd like to enter in the record something I found in the last uh, week or two, just for informational purposes. We can talk about it a little bit later. Um, and this is not really a zoning um, related issue per se, but it is a, a piece of an ordinance from the town of Summers, Connecticut. And it's a mass gatherings uh, town ordinance, which looks at events that might take place here as part of a farm event venue or other locations around uh, communities uh, in terms of how to control large events, traffic, and so forth. Um, so I just want to enter that into the record so we can refer to it later if we want to. And as Attorney Beatty mentioned, uh, after receiving this about 2 o'clock this afternoon, um, I looked at it and I, I think it goes a long way towards addressing a lot of the technical questions I had raised in my staff memo at the last meeting. Um, there are some issues that are still in there that I've put back in um, and uh, some of the substantive um, well, questions really I had for the commission in terms of decision points um, weren't in his document so I put them back in a even more annotated version of, of the text that was originally submitted. So I'm going to Enter that into the record. Can you just write public hearing in today's date in the back of that? I'll give a copy to Attorney Beatty. Same one around. I mean, I don't want to go through every little detail here because I think that's really, uh, we've got a long agenda and I don't know what the commission wants to do with the application, but that does beg the question of where we're going from here. Um, to live within the public hearing time frame, we would need to close this public hearing tonight. Um, 
since we just received, uh, essentially, and you just received uh, the proposed changes by the applicant, and now you're just receiving some additional considered changes from me, which the applicant certainly is just reading now, will not really have a chance to respond to. I don't know whether the applicant is willing to provide a time extension to extend the public hearing. No, let, let, no. Let, okay. Okay. <laughs> let, 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 me, let me talk with them first before. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll briefly go over a couple of decision points. I think I raised most of these before, though, so I did put them back in here, which is essentially the number of patrons which has been taken out. Um, yeah, the same thing. Instead of the hours, I just put in X's or blanks, so the commission can decide whether they would like the hours the applicants proposed based on some of the testimony they've heard. Do you want less? Do you want more? what do you want? Um, also, whether you want to allow um, alcohol consumption has been proposed in the uh, um, version from the applicant, or do you want to consider another approach to uh, maybe possibly a more controlled approach to alcohol use in farm events? Um, so that's in here as an option. And that's on the first bottom of the first page and top of the second page where I think I've made the same comment before. Um, limit the sale of alcohol beverages to um, not agricultural farm events to um, through a liquor permit establishment, um, excuse me, with a caterer's liquor permit or a temporary liquor permit and no other liquor permit. So that's just one way to go. Maybe others you want to think about. Um, I put back, as I mentioned, um, options for days of the week, options for the time for musical performances, which has been taken out, uh, the number of events, that was originally 20, now it's um, unlimited. Um, well, I, let, let me ask that question. The, the, was the number of events, I understand the operational plan, but I didn't know if that affected the, the number of events. Because it's got to be accessory. That's that's the issue. And I right. thought the reason for a fixed number of events twenty was that you could argue that's accessory. I, I agree. I just I my clients our preference would be to to say I, I, I to say we like we would want to limit ourselves to twenty, but we don't want to. I obviously if it reached some number that was wasn't accessory any longer. We didn't. We chose twenty kind of as a number that we thought would right. would would satisfy that. But on the other hand. Looking at the North, the North Brantford model, there was no number, so we just wanted to present okay, that as an option uh, for the town to consider. Brantford model of accessory use. I don't know. Well, it is, but it's proposed. I mean, essentially, these are general amendments, but they're really site-specific amendments because of well, that's the zones like they're being proposed in. So the site they're actually proposed for that's why I, is a full business operational almost every day of the week. I don't know if they are closed on Sundays. I don't believe they are. I think they're open every day of the week. Maybe not in season, uh, but they have a full developed site. They have paved parking. They have drainage. They have landscaping. They have lighting. But that would all be addressed with the way they proposed. They have in the special exception right? permit. Uh, it's not really clear to me how that would be proposed. Well, they would have to come site. back with a site plan and operation plan that would address all those things to our satisfaction if before you, we approved that number. If you put those requirements in here, because right now in their version there is a. Uh, a paragraph at the very end that allows the commission to essentially eliminate any requirements from the zoning regulations. That's on page five. It says, with respect to any of these regulations and required by the section of the Brantford Planning and Zoning Commission may upon request of the property or other applicant defer the immediate compliance of any of the regulations written herein at their discretion on a per non-agricultural farm event okay. or on a per parcel basis. Okay. So apart from considerations for the McKenzie decision, which uh, I think are real here, um, it's standard that it just allows you basically to waive everything in the regulations instead of the applicant having to get a variance, which I think is what McKenzie is all about. It's a court case, my understanding. So I don't know if that is really something that's adoptable <laughs> and defendable from a legal basis or not. Probably want to seek town of council opinion on that. But apart from that, as a practical matter, it leaves the standards you would hold an application to essentially completely your discretion. 
So I think that's potentially problematic. Um, what point does the number of events, you know, you're, you were concerned about accessory, but I mean, isn't there a point that if they're too successful with their accessory uses that it's no longer a farm status and doesn't that self-regulate some of the conditions on its own? Well, potentially, but right now it's proposed an accessory use. So the other provisions of the right, but I mean, we're worried about number. But if there's if the number becomes too high, then they would essentially lose farm status because yeah. it wouldn't be, you know. So I think isn't that sort of a, a I don't safe, know what that number is. I mean, that's, I, that's, that's what I'm saying. But I don't know no how the, line there. How does the farm status determine? I don't know. I, well, I I think there's a benefit in certainty. Of, of having a number, a bright line of knowing when you're over or not. Whatever that number is, you, you can find. But I, I had no problem with their initial proposal of 20, which was, you know, I mean, accessory, a lot more than the four they have now. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so um, and it's still could accessory. And if you just leave it out in the air, I think it's, I don't know. I, I like having knowing whether you're violating something. So that's kind of yeah, like I just don't know number. how you arrive at 20. Is it the number that makes it exciting? I arrived at it because they came up with it. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's how I arrived at it. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm say something. Um, is it uh, conceivable rather than trying to limit the number of events? Because you, know, you could have three events in one week and no events for a month. Is it possible, because it is a farm, accessory use, to limit the number of months they can use it? And it would be unlimited, so you you would be limiting a time frame of yeah. January, February, March, when there might not be a lot of events to begin with. Un unlimited, I don't know, April to September, October. But you, it, rather than limit the number of events, you would limit the amount of the, the months that they can have the events in. I, I it's up to them. I, they, okay. they may want it all months. I, I don't know. I, I think I, I think the more active months are obviously the warm weather months. I mean, yeah, may, I, I don't there, know. There, I'm just there may be some events that you'd have in the winter, but not only, not only up to uh, uh, Christmas with the, the trees. Right. That, I was just thinking, like, you know, January's not a, a busy month, February's not a busy month. No, unless someone, per se, wanted a wedding in those, a small well, one in the building. Well, you notice if the, if the, if the venue is a full-time operation, which it's not supposed to be, it's supposed to be an accessory right. Right. to the right. farm, right. and there's got to be some concession there right. to leave it a farm. And right. I, what I'm saying is, if you're looking for a concession for more than 20 events, maybe the way to do it is find the season. Have what you can have. There may be some that come outside the season, but you'd have to say, no, we're not open. And, and at that stage of the game, you're, you're winning on the side of having an unlimited amount of events during your season, and th that part of the year that's kind of off season, you may use a f you may lose a few things, but you can't have it 100 percent 12 months a year yeah. and, and right. unlimited events because then you have so a different we'll, venue. We'll the so probably could it be like March through December? And, uh, and I, I don't know. <laughs> or, or I don't. Yeah. Or, or just the accessory. The problem yeah. is we don't have the definition of what establishes. It's a that, that, that's a legal standard. Yeah. 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 Well, farm, farm like things are still happening when we do something else. Maybe short term bringing in a Ferris wheel and a roller coaster. Um, it, there's a lot of things that you know, without disturbing the soil, the foundations and for entertainment rights, stuff like that. Um, I think there's a pretty broad latitude, but we, we really need to. I'm sure this will come up under the circumstances. How do you determine what is really accessory to use? I, I, I think the, the regulation contemplates these entertainment right. wedding type events. And, and as long as they are, there's not a lot of them, I think you can say that is accessory. I mean, that, that's what we're actually saying by this regulation. We're sort of defining it so that if you do it, and, and the it. accessory was the, the idea behind it was that these are non agricultural events. So, a wedding reception, it's occurring in a farm setting, but it's not related to agriculture or a high school reunion or something like that. Isn't it's again, it's in this setting, but it's not um, farm related. So, that, that's what the concept was in creating this non agricultural farm event as an accessory use because it's, you know, it's clearly not related to growing crops or raising livestock or the typical type of farm activity that you'd expect. So that's... So if everybody showed up for a wedding and you gave half of them uh, 
uh, dogs are told to pick peas or weed garden. <laughs> that would be not accessory use. If it were a wedding, I would think it would be, yeah. I, I, they're there, they're there to, to celebrate someone's marriage, not, well, I mean, it depends on if it's a cow and bull getting married, I suppose you could make it, say it was a farm event, but that's a different set of circumstances. So. The likelihood of the events happening, say, Monday through Thursday, you know, that's, th say you have three nights of the, three days of the week that you have them and four days that you don't, that's to me accessory right there because it's less, you know, it's you're not even 50% of the, the work of the week. And that's assuming every week. So I think there's a, I think I, for me, the idea of accessory, you know, that's how I look at it. It's like, you know, how many days of the year are, how many of the days of the year are you actually having events? I mean, there's 365 days of the year, you know. If it's less than half of that, to me, then it's accessory. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's a lot of events, and that, I don't think yeah, they, they're I, proposing I that. And that's why when they proposed, you know, site-specific things, that made a lot of sense because it's a zone change that could be in other properties. So I like the fact that it's different, you know, that it's size for the property, what the property can support, and if you have to hash out, you know, whether gravel parking is appropriate or not appropriate, you know, you can do that on a site-specific basis. Sure. So, I, I don't know, I'm just... Proposing right. that. So, uh, that makes sense. The standard is really farming continues to happen, and every day is not dedicated to cultivating a farm. Sometimes you just have to watch the flow. In cases where you've got animals every day, you're taking care of animals, and every day you're maintaining that sort of stuff. So the principal use is. There and ongoing, as long as we can demonstrate that the principal use is there and ongoing. Any other things they do would be considered accessory. If they had software on the site, that would be accessory use. It's, uh, there's actually a definition of customarily incidental, has to be customarily associated with, which this isn't necessarily, but that's why we're defining it as non-agricultural. Right. Uh, and then related to and, and incidental. So the incidental, it's not just incidental, it's customary somehow related, like a garage is part of an accessory used to a house because it's customarily comes with a house. But in any event, we're off topic. Harry, is there anything else? Are you, did you um, want to summarize at this time? I think I'm going to leave it there. And what I essentially wanted to do by providing this in the record was to uh, give the commission the ability to look at it as a, basically a source document when we get to right. deliberations and you want to kind yeah. of figure out where to go with this. Okay. So and uh, Mr. Beatty, do you, have any comments to anything? I, I mean, here are our options right now. We can either continue the public hearing and look further, or we can close it and we can let us decide. You've given us all the input and we'll figure out what we come up with. If you could give me just a minute to okay. confer with my clients. Okay, that'd absolutely. Be, that'd Meantime, I'll open up the public and see if anyone wants to do it, if that's all right. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone in the public who wants to comment on this item? We'll, we'll, we'll let Mr. Beatty confer with his clients.
is someone here on the next public hearing? I'm just, uh, uh, or wait a minute, are they? Yep. Okay. Yes, yeah, Mr. Freddy. Okay. Um, Sure, absolutely. Uh, Tony Nezzo. Yep. Um, the only reason why we came up with other numbers, mm -hmm. too, is Van Wilgens is our neighbor. Right. They're right next door. And they're going seven days a week. Right. So we figured, uh, you know, a couple more, or, you know, I would, you know, that's all. I'm not looking to do a full time thing out of it. Right. Okay. I mean, I have my, I have a business that I run, too. Right. Just looking to make some extra money for the farm. Right. That's all. We Thank understand. you. We would be agreeable to leaving the public hearing open. You would? Okay. So. Now, you, you understand that we don't meet in August? I did not know that. Okay. okay. Uh, so the next meeting would be when? Uh, September 3rd. So the first week of September. Do you guys feel that you have enough vendors? I'm sorry. Do you feel that you have enough information to close it? And we, we could close it and we'll come up with something. The, the, the reason for keeping it open is, is it, you may not like what we come up with. I, 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 mean, that, I mean, that's... Well, the only thing that I'm yeah. saying, if you have a wedding, you want alcohol, you want food. Right. So if you think on that line right. yourself... No, I, and I understand that point. On that, that's all I'm I, concerned. I understand. I, and I, Harry, Harry came up with an idea of no alcohol. No, no, food. no, no, I, no. Or so I don't know. No, or, or, the, quick or, or, or the type of permit you have to get. I understand that you would not want. Yeah, to, I understand yeah, that. I just, so we'll, I understand your point. So you, yeah, you just can, make it easier on everybody. I don't right. know. Right. So, so I don't. I know that changes things. I'm sorry to <laughs> mention that that we didn't. No, 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 no I'm glad you did. So, so do you want to keep the? No, I understand. Do you want? Do you want to keep the public hearing open, or do you want to? Um, do you want us to close it? I think they'd rather close it. Then. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, and, and I, we did ask for public comment, and there was none. So we we can close this matter as a public hearing, and we'll take it up, and we'll we'll study it and okay. and uh, take it up at our September meeting. Okay. Okay. All right. So you, you but you won't be voting on it tonight. No, we will not be voting. We just got a lot of new stuff tonight, so we're not going to be voting on this tonight. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That brings us to our our second matter, which is. Uh, Terry Malloy, 240 Thimble Island Road, special exception for the demolition and rebuilding of single family home. Do we have a staff report on this? No. Uh, okay. Because we were holding off. Okay. Turn the arrow. <laughs> okay, and it's on. Yep. Okay. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Jim Freddy, Criscolo Engineering, uh, here at 420 East Main Street, Frankfurt. Uh, the project is at 240 Thimble Islands Road. Um, if you're familiar with the area, right across the street is the metal sculptures that are adjacent to the marsh. Um, the proposal is to tear down the existing house that was built in the 30s. Um, highlighted here in yellow, uh, and basically reconstruct it on the same footprint with some additions that are actually in the within the setbacks that are forming. So we did get variances for removing and putting back the house that's part of the house that's non-conforming in the same spot. Uh, and, and there's various reasons for, that we had for that. Um, that is the highest point of the lot. Um, so in terms of uh, FEMA compliance, it's the, where the house was located is the best situation. Um, also, we have we, we we're replacing the septic system, um, and in order to do that, we had to raise the system up substantially. Um, so there's uh, uh, the room to do that was only here, basically. Um, the garage will remain. Uh, it's been painted recently. Um, the outline in red is the entire property. It's uh, about 21,000 square feet. Uh, shown in green here is the t uh, limits of the tidal wetland. 
there is a culvert under Thimble Island Road here, and so this is all tidal on this on the south side of the or west side of this, and this is the marsh. Um, uh, so the, the proposed septic system is shown here in blue. Uh, that had been reviewed and approved by East Shore Health Department already. Uh, what we're also showing here uh, along the front is a um, I'm going to call it a stone fence. Uh, it's a stone wall, but it's not retaining anything in the front. It's a, basically a, a you know decorative stone wall kind of thing with a hedge behind it. Um, there is a, a, a and I'll explain that why I'm mentioning this later. But there is a small wall here um, that we are using to retain some of the fill that we had to place for the, the front yard for the septic system. Um, but in both cases, th this is less than three feet high, and this is less than three feet high, so technically by the um, zoning um, section that deals with retaining walls, it's a landscape wall. It doesn't need to meet any setbacks or doesn't even need a zoning permit. Um, but the house, uh, it's a three-bedroom house. Uh, again, the additions are in orange. This is a heated space, and there's a deck area, and then this is a pavilion that would just be screened with actually a green roof. Um, we have provided a small little rain garden area here for the roof uh, runoff. Uh, and we have also received, uh, my understanding is, uh, Stony Creek Review Board approval. Uh, they did have some minor comments. Um, uh, Jim Riley is here with me, prepared to architectural plans, and he could go over the house if you'd like and show you what, what it looks like and what the uh, Stony Creek mentioned. There were, and this is, I'm sure, going to be the topic of conversation. Um, originally, this plan, we weren't showing this retaining wall. We were, we were filling around the house. Our, our, first, our first go with this that we <coughs> got submitted was we, we were going to try to fill around this house and possibly remove the, flood, the structure from the flood zone entirely. And uh, the town engineer and I had talked about that, and he said, basically, no way. <laughs> um, you're basically creating an island by doing that, that's not what the intent of the uh, Loma was really set up for. It's if maybe if a corner of the house is in, you can fill around it, but not take the whole house out. Um, so we removed all the fill that we had around here, and, and that's part of how the retaining this little wall came about. Uh, the first letter from DEP basically commenting on that first plan that showed all that fill. There was a retaining wall in the back to limit the fill going on the neighbor's property. Um, uh, I think they're going to have to read it into the yes. record. But um, most of the items on the plan have to do with that. Uh, on most of the items on the comment, the first set of comments was had to do with that first plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we were shown a basement, which we can't have. Um, so that the, any of the comments have to do with that are really don't apply anymore. We have a crawl space. Um, the, uh, she mentioned some variances. We, we already received that. Uh, the pavilion roof, the downspout should be directed to a rain garden. Well, we're directing all the downspouts to a rain garden now, and the, the pavilion roof will actually be a green roof. Um, and then there's some typical comments about um, stockpile areas and that sort of thing, dewatering efforts. Uh, we did add a watering detail to the plans in case they have to do that. But the, there, there's a basement there now that's been dry. Uh, we're actually raising the floor, so I don't think the watering is going to be an issue for any of the construction here. Um, so the plan got sent back, as you see it now, with the fill removed and the wall added. And the additional comment from the reviewer was we still consider the this wall as uh, flood and erosion, the shoreline flood and erosion. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that it is. Uh, yeah, I think it's incidental to landscaping because it's less than three feet high, and that's what their regulations say it is. Um, and the definition, the DEP's definition of a shoreline flood and erosion control structure is any structure the purpose or effect of which is to control flooding or erosion from tidal, coastal, or navigable waters. Includes breakwaters, bulkheads, groins, jetties, riprap, seawalls, 
placement of concrete, rocks, or other significant barriers to the flow of floodwaters or the movement of sediments along the shoreline. Well, that's not the case here. We're not in a flood zone. We're not dealing with wave action here. We're in an AE zone. Um, there's a potential of flooding, but it doesn't see floodwaters Could, regularly. I mean, it is a, is a flood zone. It's just not a velocity zone, right? It's, right. So it's not a, a coastal zone. flood hazard zone. Right. It's a flood zone. Flood zone. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think that the wall truly meets the definition of yeah, the, the purpose of the wall is just a retaining wall to keep the, the fill. The purpose up. of the wall is to limit the fill that we need for the septic system. It wasn't to <coughs> direct flood waters or anything like that. Uh, again, we're we're adjacent to the tidal marsh. The the sound is on the other side of the road. Basically, it's, it's more or less tidal controlled by this culvert that's here. Um, so I think I mean. I think that was the only real outstanding issue. Um, we've addressed everything else, so it's, it's really up to the commission whether or not they feel it's a flood erosion control structure. Thanks. Uh, Do you want to go over the house? Uh, Does anyone want to go over the house? Don't you want to? No. I know the elevations that the house are at. Okay. You know, uh, relative to flood. Elevations. Uh, these are elevations. This is street. Uh, my name is Jim Riley, 4500 Ridge Road, North Haven. Um, this is the south side along the street, mostly glass. And here's the pavilion and the deck area along the street, coming towards the marsh. And your west side, it's going to be open up to the deck area and heading towards the marsh. What elevation? Where's the flood zone elevation versus uh, the finished floor? Finished floor is right here. What elevation is that? 15. So that's at right the foot above. There's actually two flood zones on the property at 12 and 13, so we're two feet above 13. Okay. And cross. so those lower areas are? This is your crawl space line. Right, and then to the left, Through that's here. the second flood zone that's lower? Underneath the deck here. Um, hard to see in. This, but this, this is the 8, 12, the 13, 13 on this side, 12 here. Okay. And then this is the 12 to X. So there is this corner is an X. So, so that the house and the addition are at 15. 15. The deck is at? The house is in, um, in the, basically between here, everything in between here is at is the 8, 12. And then everything basically in the marsh is 13. Okay. And so what's the elevation of the garage? I'm just, what's the elevation, the finished floor elevation of the garage? Uh, the existing garage is at 7.6. So that's in the flood zone, the rest of the Yes. Okay. And, and just so, other than painted it right here. You had to add a lot of fill for the septic, is that the deal? That's correct. Because the, right. the bottom of the system had to be raised up to stay out of the groundwater. And that's what's driving the retaining the wall, the wall the right? Fill in, the, the fill in the front yard is all due to the septic system. There yeah, was, and that's. That's the whole reason for the walls, for the, Correct. because you had to add the fill. Is there ledge? Is that why? You're... Uh, yeah, uh, there, there's ledge outcropping that the deck is kind of going over. That was the reason why the health department allowed us to do the additions here because it's not space we could have ever used for septic. And part of the other limiting factor of putting in this landscape wall um, is to leave the exposed rock exposed. Right. You want to see the what was the existing septic where that new proposed septic is uh, and you're having to... It was down here in the lower areas, um, which is... Um, we dug a hole there when we did the septic, we did the soil testing, and then we left a <laughs> two-foot hole there for uh, a perk test. And that got filled in for a while, and then below that two-foot stayed the water was right there, so that's why the system had to be lifted up. That's what I figured. Well, I, that was really my question around the elevations. I, I, yeah, see, so. I guess my other question is the, can you go back to the site plan? Is that an existing wall on the, the street side? Because it looks like it's carrying off the property. Yes. Yeah. No, that's proposed. So uh, the red are, line's the property line? Yeah, we will, we can get um, uh, creating rights on the neighboring property. So, uh, 
Okay. So, so the red line's a proper line. You have to get grading rights to allow for the septic. Yeah. So, the way this house sits now, it, it kind of drops off right next to the house. It kind of gets to this little bit of a bowl here. So we're going to grade up to the house to make it better for them, also. And they're in agreement. Yes. But we don't have anything no, to put on the record at this point. Okay. It's the same right. owner. No, but, um, it's the same owner. Yeah. Easement, oh, it's the same owner. We're just saying. Is that right? Uh, Is that right? It's Terry's partner. Oh, Terry's partner. Okay. okay. All right. So, probably need to nail down something, some kind of condition or something. Okay. Um, I'm just going to jump in. If you're done, are you done? Yeah. Okay. Um, we do have to read the letter in the record. Um, before I do that, it just, um, I guess I've been the staff person kind of saying I'm a little, well, very reluctant to um, recommend in contradiction to. Um, the recommendation from the DEP uh, that it's a shoreline photo erosion control structure. I don't consider myself, and I don't know if you do, Rich, any kind of expert on the definition of what that is. Um, so um, I suggested to, uh, to Jim that trying to have some dialogue with the, uh, the environmental analyst DEP might be the way to go to see if I uh, could modify this letter or the you can convince her that it's not a shoreline flood erosion control structure, um, but I understand she's been out of the office since the letter was received, so that has not been able to take place. Um, so I don't know whether the best thing, I think, in my mind to do is, uh, from staff's point, we're recommending that it be tabled until September, at which point hopefully that some discussion will take place and maybe this recommendation could be uh, modified by the state to allow you to the application with having to contradict DEP. Um, Can you read her letter? I, I will, well, yeah, yeah, let me do that. I mean, there are a lot of issues that uh, that uh, Mr. Pretty said have already been handled, but let me read it into the record. Uh, coastal site plan review for demolition and rebuild of a residence and a mandatory referral for a shoreline flood and erosion control structure at 240 Thimble Island, it should be Islands Road, Terry. Mallory applicant. Dear Commissioners, thank you for referring this coastal site plan review and mandatory referral for a flood and erosion control wall received June 12, 2019 to us for review and comment. Project description. Site, subject site is a 21,240 square foot waterfront lot on tidal wetlands zone R3. The applicant proposes to demolish and rebuild existing residence with a first floor elevation of 15 feet and construct a flood and erosion control wall in flood zone AE13. Although the elevation of the proposed house is FEMA compliant, the proposed retention of the basement is not FEMA compliant. Basements are not allowed in flood zones. Coastal resources on the site are significant, include coastal flood hazard area, AE 13 and X, tidal wetlands, and shorelands. We recommend the protections afforded to tidal wetlands include the minimum required rear yard of 30 feet. Tidal wetlands. The property abuts flag tidal wetlands. The commission and the applicant should be aware that tidal wetlands do migrate over time. No work is allowed in a tidal wetlands area without a permit from the DEP Land and Water Resources Division, including placing fill and or discharge of dewatering operations. Mandatory referral for shoreline flood and erosion control structure. The proposed flood and erosion control wall is within the A zone. If the wall is proposed to hold back soil or floodwaters, then it qualifies as a flood and erosion control structure. New dwellings need to be designed such that shoreline armament would not become necessary and unavoidable to protect the dwelling from flooding or erosion. Shoreline flood and erosion control structures are only allowed in limited circumstances to protect existing residences constructed before 1995 or infrastructure such as roads or public access walkways. Since this proposed residence does not date back to 1995, a shoreline flood and erosion control structure cannot be approved at this waterfront site. We recommend that the Planning and Zoning Commission deny approval for the shoreline flood and erosion control structure proposed on the site. Site plan issues. And several bullets here. First bullet, it appears that the existing basement at elevation six feet is proposed to be retained for the new residents. Basements are not allowed below the base flood elevation BFE of 13 feet in flood zone A. The existing basement should either be filled with concrete or broken up and removed from the site. Next bullet, Bilco basement door should be removed as well since no basement is allowed in flood zone A. Third bullet, are there variances granted for the lot to retain a non-compliant side yard of 10.5 feet and a non-compliant rear yard of 18.5 feet? It appears that the new residence could be designed to meet all the minimum yard requirements for this district. 
The next bullet, proposed pavilion should not be sited as close as proposed to the tidal wetlands. Tidal wetlands do migrate over time and a future flood and erosion control structure will not be approval to protect the footing slab of the proposed pavilion. If the pavilion has a roof, the downspout should be directed to a constructed rain garden rather than allowed to migrate toward tidal wetlands. Fresh water adversely impacts the salinity of tidal wetlands. Rain downspouts should be directed to constructed rain gardens. Footing drain outlet pipe should be directed to constructed rain garden rather than directed toward tidal wetlands. The site plan sheets submitted do not illustrate where the mechanicals will be located. No basement is allowed in this flood zone. An area in the residence, perhaps the attic, question mark, ends quote, in uh, parentheses, should be reserved to house the mechanicals such as the furnace, hot water heater, etc. Next bullet, the commission should carefully review the proposed fill, which appears to potentially shed water into the adjacent site at number 10 Wallace Road. Next bullet, any soil stockpile areas on the site should be ringed with hay bales or silt fencing to prevent erosion. Next bullet, in case dewatering efforts are required, the site plan should illustrate the location of the discharge area or settling pond, and under no circumstances shall the water be directed or discharged to or towards the tidal wetlands. The last bullet, applicants should notify the town's Wetlands officer, once all site fencing is, silt fencing is installed for an on-site inspection before site work commences. Last bullet, site plan should delineate the limits of top disturbance, in quotes, on the site. Conclusion, we recommend the site plan be redesigned to eliminate the existing basement, which is not FEMA compliant, as well as eliminate the retaining wall, redesign the fill proposal in the rear yard to not adversely impact neighbors by directing water off-site construct rain gardens to accept roof drainage and footing drainage to allow stormwater to infiltrate on site. We hope that these comments are helpful to the commission. Pursuant to CGS section 22A-110, we request these comments be read into the record at a public hearing for this application. If we can be of further assistance to you in this or any other coastal management or Long Island Sound related matter, please feel free to contact me at 860-424-3138. Sincerely, Carol Szymanski, Environmental Analyst 2. This had arrived in as an email um, and copied in it was Diane Pitchkovic, who was the FEMA and FIP coordinator at DDP. Um, uh, she had also commented about the same stuff. We eliminated the basement, made it a crawl space, route of upgrade on the side, make it qualify as a crawl space. Um, the fill that, and the retaining wall that she's talking about is one of the plan. So this all went back. The same reviewer, Carol Zemanski's last comment through email, um, back to Rich and Harry and I were copying. It says, we continue to view the proposed walls on site as flood and erosion control structures. The commission may disagree with us and choose not to approve or deny the walls as such. The walls and the bulk of the residents are proposed on flood zone. The walls will be retaining soil on site. That was the day before she left the Read that again. Hey, the wording's a little bizarre. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, you need to use the mic, uh, Jim. Sorry. Thank you. Um, her last comment was, we continue to view the proposed walls on site as flood and erosion control structures. The commission may disagree with us and choose not to approve or deny the walls as such. The walls and the bulk of the residents are proposed in a flood zone in the wall, 8012, and the walls will be retaining soil on the site. So basically, she put it back in your lap. Wasn't there a wasn't there a definition about that they would be allowed if they were if they were necessary for, for the infrastructure, infrastructure. and Correct. wouldn't the septic system be considered infrastructure, even though it wasn't expressly stated? I would consider infrastructure, but I can't tell you specifically if they meant private infrastructure or public infrastructure. Yeah. Doesn't say. Well, it's infrastructure is necessary to the function of the house that preexisted. I agree. 
but as far as the interpretation of the statute, which you, you read, it's really vague. It's really just the, it's, it's really just pushing the point that they want all these structures FEMA compliant. Mm -hmm. We're not dealing with that here. We have a FEMA compliant thing, and we're not dealing uh, with natural erosion patterns, which they also, you know, like to preserve. Um, and we're the ones with the local knowledge. And uh, so we're the ones that know what's going on here. And you know, we have a town, we have an improved building lot, we have a house, we have an engineered septic, it's the only place it can go. The only way to hold the solves is with this. I think it meets the qualification that he mentioned before that it's not really a flood neurologic tool structure. It's not designed to control flooding. It's not very that long I mean, to control flooding. This is, it's designed to have the septic system it, work properly. That's all it's doing. It's retaining mm -hmm. the soils for a septic system. It's for, the, it's for the septic system. So this has nothing to do with... Correct. It's actually limiting the amount of fill we would have to bring in. You know, because we have to fill up here, so to we have to continue this action around the house, basically. Right? And I, but I should tell you, I've seen this situation before with DEP, and they've approved such walls. I mean, I, I don't know why, you know, Carol, you know, she wants us to do the interpretation of the statute, and that's the way I, I read her last comment. And I'm reading this, any structure, the purpose or effect of which is to control flooding or erosion from tidal waters. So if we're stopping the water from growing up, that's a flood erosion uh, and erosion control structure, but not if it's just retaining fill just right. for the septic right. system. It's right. not designed to prevent the water from right. coming up. We're not on the shore dealing with wave action. Mm -hmm. This wall doesn't apply to, to that situation you just mentioned. It doesn't seem to. I mean, the, it's to retain the soil, not to prevent water from spreading out and what's the tidal option? water. <laughs> As a town of Brantford, what's the option? Make the lot unusable? Add more fill in a flood well, zone, she, which she would can. prevent the expansion I know. of the, the tidal well, wetlands, which I, she wants to promote. <laughs> I think even if you took the wall <laughs> away, you'd have more it. erosion into the tidal yeah, wetlands. Yeah, I think. I, I don't know. It seems like. It doesn't seem that the purpose, I guess that the scenario is that it's in an AE zone, so there could be a flood event where this wall could hinder the, the could natural the flow of the water. It. I but, guess that's the theory, right? But it's how long of a wall. But that's not the exact you know, purpose of the wall. It's a tiny no. wall. It's not like we're talking about hundreds of feet. I agree with John's interpretation. And it's not the function of the wall. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's been my experience that they don't generally visit the sites. They just look, they're looking at Google Earth and the paper exactly. and they actually see it. And that's because ultimately it's our decision. They don't have time <laughs> see it. We're the ones with the local knowledge. I, frankly, I'm, I was a little concerned though with the, do you need slope rights or something from an adjacent property? Is that something we need to get into? It's not an issue. We can formally do it, but we don't really need it. We can do it. Well, I mean, if someone sold the property or whatever, I mean, the neighboring property. It's, yeah, I think the record should reflect the, you know. I, I don't know. And then once it's done, it's done, you know. Right. I, I, I don't know if you need it. It just showed the wall going on to the adjacent property. I, I don't know if any filling or, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's needed. I don't, we don't have a staff report on this one. <laughs> Yeah, I, because, well, because I understand. A fly code, some kind of condition requiring submittal of some documents um, suitable to town council that you would have rights, rights to, to, do to, that, to right. do that from the joint buddy property owner. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, we already have permission, but if we need legal documentation, we can, yeah, yeah, we can provide that. Do it, so. Okay. Well, this is a public hearing. Anyone in the public wish to comment? Yes, public. yes, sir. You can grab a mic or speak yeah. into the mic. I'd just like to speak in favor. I'm Ted Ells, and I live at 255 Thimble Islands Road. Uh, I own property, which is catacorner to this property. Uh, I also own um, uh, a vacant lot uh, across, across from the property. My wife owns uh, a property at Two Linden Point Road, which is also across the property. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment on this? 
Seeing none, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think pretty straightforward. I mean, we do a lot of these things we do lately, tear down the bills, and all the questions we've got. You should probably grab a mic, sorry. <laughs> Again, I think the only one outstanding issue was that little piece of wall that we were just discussing. Um, okay. Okay, we can, uh, maybe we'll close, close this matter then as a public hearing. Thank you. And we'll, maybe we might be able to take it up. So thank you. That concludes our public hearings. Next on the agenda, we do have uh, minutes from our July 11th meeting that were sent out. And uh, if you had a chance to review those, is someone going to make an appropriate motion? Could you spell my name correctly? <gasps> Two Z's, oh please. Two Z's. Double Z, Mars. Z. <laughs> with the with the correction of uh, Marcy's last name, is there any other uh, corrections or additions? If not someone want to make a uh, appropriate motion. Move this corrected. Motion made by Joe to approve the minutes with the correction of Marcy's last name. Is there a second? Second. Second by Marcy. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes adopted. Correspondence? What do we got here? We have three items of correspondence with respect to cell tower um, installations. Um, one's at 50 Maple Street. It's a proposed modification. Um, there is one. Let's say also at 50 Maple Street, uh, 10 Sylvia Street. Also proposing a modify, modification in the existing facility. And that is it. I've got all the reams of documents on 10 Sylvia Street, if you're interested. Great. That's it. Thanks. And no other correspondence? No. OK. Um, do we want to take up the public hearing item we just heard on? Do we have? Uh, <laughs> What, do you need time to draft the conditions? We obviously need the CAM consistency and everything else. Yeah, you and certainly need the typical finding, which, uh, based on past experience, I'm, I'm sure you can probably rattle yeah. right off <laughs> for the right. record. Um, we can put in the typical condition about soil and erosion controls prior to um, start of construction. Start of construction, and we can come up with some kind of condition. Um, Documentation, uh, suitable documentation to the um, satisfaction of the town council shall be submitted prior to uh, issuance of a zoning permit or the zoning right. issuance of a building permit to document that um, uh, the applicant has the right to grade onto adjoining property and construct the wall as shown on the post plan. Okay, so. Uh are we okay? I guess we're, we're finding that this is not a flood erosion, a flood erosion control structure. So everyone kind of agrees with yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so is there a motion to approve the application with the finding of consistency with the policies of the Coastal Area Management Act and it incorporates the conditions necessary to mitigate adverse impacts on coastal resources and uh, no water dependent uses? And with the conditions that Harry mentioned with the uh, is the notification of the zoning enforcement officer to inspect the the uh, solar erosion controls. controls, the solar erosion controls, the and also uh, whatever Harry said slope <laughs> the, the, about ensuring that they have adequate the slope rights to the satisfaction of town council to perform the work of the wall and any other work on the adjacent property. So moved as presented. Okay, motion made by Marcy. Is there a second? Second by John. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So, done with that. Number one old business is Joshua Onofrio, special exception modification, uh, 119 Cedar Street. Is Apkin here on that? And I believe uh, we granted a waiver of the public hearing at our last meeting, is that correct?
Everyone see that? Do you guys see that over there? Yeah, okay. You can stand there or you can grab a mic if you like. I'll stand in the corner. Okay. Uh, my name is Josh Onofrio. I'm the owner of uh, 119 Cedar Street, in the corner of um, uh, Route 1. If, uh, if you guys are familiar with the property, uh, you know it's a, it's a very tight, small site. It's non-conforming to begin with. Um, and the whole goal was to clean the property up as best as possible, bring it back to life, um, with a lot of restrictions involved. And, uh, trying to clean the property up, obviously, a lot of permits are needed. Uh, State Department, Zoning Department, Building Department, uh, Wetlands, um, Fire Department. And when everybody brings their restrictions to the plan on such a tight property, things overlap um, throughout the project, throughout the um, process, trying to keep all departments as happy as possible and, and stick to the guidelines. Um, even though it is a non-conforming to begin with, there's a lot of hurdles that needed to, uh, to overcome. Um, and so working, the, working my best to try to get everybody as happy as possible. I uh, just want to say that to date to, to now, um, all departments have approved this would be the last stop for the property. Um, so with that, if there's any questions, uh, so forth. I'm Thanks. Uh, Rich, did you uh, prepare the staff report? Uh, yes, I did. Um, as Josh noted, it's, this goes back a few years, and uh, there were, I think in the staff report, I uh, listed some of the various, uh, the variances and site plans uh, that were approved, a uh, special exception in 20, 2018. Application is being submitted to modify the special exception approval based on recent Zoning Board of Appeals approval, July 16, 2019, for variances to remedy existing deviations from the approved site plan and the improvements as constructed. Uh, the retaining wall was, uh, was not constructed in the approved location and non-compliant with the zoning regulations to require a six-foot distance from the, any parking space. And that's the, that's the really the gist of uh, what we're looking at. In the Wetlands Commission approved the constructed location of the retaining wall on May 9, 2019. And um, that's, that's really what it is. So we're just looking at uh, the recommendation with the commission approve the application which approves the existing parking spaces to be located within six feet uh, of, a, of the retaining wall. The following conditions shall apply. All conditions of the previous approvals remain in full force and effect as they may still apply. And street trees planted shall be documented to be two and a half to three inch in caliber or be planted with new trees of this size at a reasonably appropriate time or bonded as provided in the zoning regulations. Okay. So really, So we have uh, the uh, retaining wall and then the parking spaces within six feet of the uh, retaining wall. <clears throat> also, uh, they've reconfigured the handicapped ramp. Uh, so, but basically that would be, uh, that would be what we're approving the changes to the uh, plan uh, for handicapped, uh, oh, for the retaining wall and the parking spaces. Great. Thanks, Rich. Uh, questions, comments from commission? Seems pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, then does someone want to make a motion to approve the application with the two conditions read by Rich on page three of the staff report that the previous conditions remain in effect and that this about the street trees that was he also read. Can, can I make one quick comment? Sure. I probably should insert the word caliper after three inch, just so. Okay. Otherwise, Add the word short tree. caliper, right. Yeah. <laughs> With that addition, does someone want to make that motion? So moved. So moved by John. Is there a second? Second. 
Second by Joe. Which seems oh, yeah. Absence. Uh, yeah. Joe's absence. Uh, um, <laughs> who's up? Who's up now? It would be Paul. Paul. Did it get too cold? He's coming back, probably. Okay, Paul, you're up. All those in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Okay. You're all set. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that. Uh, go to item number two, which is the town of Brantford. The. Modif special exception modification for the community center. Uh, you can proceed. Great. Um, good evening. My name is Graham Curtis, professional engineer with DTC. Um, bringing some deja vu to this project. Seems like it's been going on a while. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not to you, but to us, it's been a while. So hopefully, we're on the home stretch. If you've been by there recently, um, basically we're here tonight just to kind of clean up. Uh, hopefully, a few loose ends, and just to kind of update what's transpired in the last few months. Um, Basically, we've made some changes to the site plan and also some architectural changes that I'll discuss. I'd like to start off with the... Uh... Hello? Yes. Great. Um, basically, I'll just walk you through the site plan changes and then... Uh, first of all, the most significant thing that was, was changed was the bike path through here. Um, there's an ongoing kind of planning study, which you may be part of, to look at different bike, bike paths. <coughs> the decision was made to eliminate the uh, bike route through the site for various reasons, the tree routes and so on and so forth, and it was felt as a larger, you know, global look rather than this was short segment. So this was eliminated um, as the items. Um, because of that, we relocated the bike rack, which were down here. We located the bike rack. We, we moved it over here and extended the sidewalk. We felt this was a more logical place. People coming on the street would put their bikes here and they'd walk into the building as opposed to going on here uh, in that direction. Um, the other items that were changed, number three, uh, the benches. Now that the, because the bike path is not there, it didn't make sense to have the benches there. So we relocated the benches uh, up in here and into this kind of plaza area. We thought that we'd get a lot more use and actually we, 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 they've already been relocated. If you see it on there, I think it makes for a nice, very nice space. Um, uh, number four, as part of that, the, the, some of the rain gardens were eliminated along here because we no longer had the, um, the grading for this part. And that's been in junk, done in conjunction with the town engineer, and he's been involved in uh, dealing with the drainage issues. Uh, number five, the fifth item, um, there was some trees along here that were um, in marginal shape, the arborist came out and looked at them and we decided in conjunction with the neighbors to kind of reestablish a more formal street tree layout along the street as part of a, also an ongoing planning effort. So these trees have been um, located um, along here and cleaned out some of the kind of scrubby stuff that was in this location. Uh, number six, um, the neighbors objected this, this wall has been built, this patio in this area. Um, the neighbors, uh, Jamie in conjunction met with some of the neighbors and they asked it for more, more uh, taller landscaping to be installed in this area. Uh, originally it was some low landscaping but they wanted more immediate effect because it's like a six foot high wall so there's some six, five, six foot arbor varieties that are already full grown that have been installed in this area. Here, um, additionally there were some minor landscaping changes. Um, you know, with the owner, just working with the owner, they just wanted a few things moved around for, for doors and things like that. Um, in this area, in this area, in this area. Um, I think that's most of the landscaping changes that I'm aware of. There's, there's been numerous versions of that, so Harry may correct me, there might have been a few other changes, but I'm sure he'll in his um, presentation. Um, so with that to site, moving on to the building. Uh, 
Um, so there's two, two major elements, in which you, if you've been by there, you probably noticed them. Uh, first of all, the original uh, community center sign that was, was going to be full height all the way across. Because of the, the way the parking ramps up and down, if we extended this full height, the wall was going to get to be like three or four feet tall at the end, which became kind of an issue with the sight line as you're coming out, so it was kind of blocking the view. So the desire was to step the wall down um, here and here. It's different, it's a little steeper on this side, so it's not symmetrical, but that was reviewed by the Architecture Review Committee and it, they, they found it acceptable. I personally think it's you know, aesthetically an improvement what it was before, with it was gonna be a wall. This, this blends in much nicer. Um, the other significant thing is that if you went by there, there was some duct work. The original plan that we presented had a roof screen around the mechanical equipment. Um, for, during construction, they were unable to get the coordinate, get the duct work to fit inside that location because it was structure, you know, the way the structure of the building was. So there was duct work that was exposed. Um, we went in front of the architectural review board, the town center committee, and also the architectural reviewed it. And the decision was to made to relocate some of the um, excess roof screen and create another low screen in front of the building. It's you know, shown here in green. It'll be the same color as the rest of the roof screens. I'm just showing the green for, for highlight. And then the, the, so that there was excess, excess stock left over from the emergency generator. So that's, we're going to use a different product on that side, which works better to wrap the generator. But from this screen, we're no longer seeing the ductwork exposed. Um, I think that's, that's about it. Was, there was a stair here that was added. Um, code. You know, uh, it was an AHJ uh, interpretation that we needed access. You couldn't exit this this, camp, this balcony through the building. You have to have access to the <coughs> grade. So this was added in, uh, here. It's a stair. And then I think it will function better, actually, from a practical point of view, having that stair so people can access it without having to go through the building at, at night. Um, that's basically the changes that, uh, that we've made so far. Hopefully, hopefully people are happy with the building. I think it's uh, going to take a little while, but it's going to be a very nice building. And I think the staff and town board review comments have made it for a much better project than maybe perhaps it would have been. So. Do, you, do you have a target opening date? Or is that uh, too bold? Why do you ask? <laughs> we're, we're very close. I mean, there's, there's always moving. I mean, the contract will be done. There'll be some moving stuff. So right. it'll be transition. But we're he's getting down to the final paint drops and uh, yeah. Electric friction. Yeah, I don't know what's going on, on the inside. Outside looks pretty done. Yeah, the inside. Looks, well, hopefully, right. hopefully, even we have a ribbon cutting shortly. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's very impressive on the inside. Even, you know, in my opinion, almost more so on the inside than the outside. So, hmm. Not doing Great. Harry, uh, anything uh, you want to summarize for us here? Sure, just quickly. Um, I think the changes are pretty completely described. I'll just add a little bit about the couple of things in the landscaping. Um, Around the perimeter of the building, um, the landscaping that's proposed even at this point with some eliminations is well above and beyond what's required in the zoning regulations, so that's really no issue whatsoever. Um, and I understand um, some of the changes at Prospect and Church Street up in this sort of corner there. Um, some of those are related to the issues, subsurface conditions that were found during construction, so some of the existing vegetation that was uh, originally hoped to be retained had to be uh, removed. So this is really a replacement design for some of the things that came down in a more logical way along the street trees, along the perimeter of the property. Uh, there were two elements that um, I don't think were really mentioned um, outside of those areas. One is, um, um, I think it's three groupings of uh, small inkberry plants. Um, along the Prospect Street side of the parking lot. Um, those were in the previously approved plan. Uh, it's a requirement of the, the town center village district um, that screen parking areas, even though this is not a new parking area. So you could look at it to the extent it's, it does not need to be brought into conformance with the full requirements of, of the zoning regulations because it only needs to be done to the extent practicable and this has been that way for since the parking lot was put in. Uh, trees are proposed there. You certainly want to have any landscaping that's proposed not interfere with sight distance uh, coming out of there. So, I mean, I think what was proposed before is pretty low lying stuff. Um, so that's something for you to think about and decide whether you want to, um, or you're okay with the elimination? Excuse me? You said they were inkberries. Yeah, they were inkberries. Those look good, but 
five to six feet. Which they will get that big? Visible. Really? That's going to be a problem then. They need a lot of maintenance too. So it could be something like a low, you mean? I mean. You're going to get something so low lying, what's the visual impact? So I don't know if it's even worthwhile. So I just want to throw that out to you because regulations do, um, do require some consideration of screening the parking areas. Um, there was also on the plan a line of um, junipers along the southerly edge of the parking area on the south side of the building. Um, there are some trees proposed there. These were to be between the trees. So I'll go up to point <coughs> that out. It's really along here, and they would have screened uh, budding properties from headlight glare. Is this really on? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, there are, however, this is a detention area right here, so there have been some, uh, this was a comment, the public hearing and requirement of I think the last modification round. And these, I believe, are white firs that are uh, going to get pretty big. Um, so you've got that as a screening element, but it's a little far from the parking lot. It would probably help. Is it really completely necessary? I'll leave that to you. But this, the firs or the other one? I'm not sure. The other one. It's, it's low junipers. It would just grow a little bit and provide a screen to the, the well, headlight. The firs are going to probably have more of an impact on the junipers. Yeah, they just don't line the whole edge of the parking lot. They're just grouped around the detention area. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to have more impact. Yeah, absolutely. I would want to look at the site distance because sometimes it, it doesn't have to be right on to screen it. Yeah. It's the Exactly. Yeah, I think so, but there's also some kind of scrubby vegetation on the property too. So, and I, I guess, you know, I think if you add too many, you know, it's kind of, I think it's overkill potentially if you start doing. Well, that's what I'm saying. You don't need to put it right up, up on the edge of the parking to create the screen. You can put it towards the property line. Right, and get more paint the, the screen. Right. And then you have the visual corridor from the parking lot, which is nice. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure the, if we get complaints after the fact because the lights will be more than willing to add a few more furs or. You know, whatever, whatever. But I still would add them towards the property. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah you're a little constrained because of the drainage. Right. Case, and it's about it. Yeah. I mean, we, we could add more here. I mean, uh, as we actually operate, you know, we could we could see if there's actually lights being thrown in there, and if there's any complaints, I'm sure uh, I'm sure we'll be more than glad to accommodate you know whatever extra trees you know shrubs or trees he wants on the property. So I've thrown in a couple conditions if you choose to uh, put those two pieces of landscaping back in or you, you can delete them if you don't want to. I would suggest another condition, though, about the uh, replacement screening for the generator, which could read uh, replacement screening for the generator along the south side of the building shall be proposed for the review and approval of the town planner. Um, that could be as he may be advised by the town center review board, something I might email them with the final design of it. Did the town center recommend that that be done? It was mentioned at the meeting that there would be a new material. I guess the material that was originally proposed had needed a bracing bracket that was going to be impossible to really install. So looking at different options for screening of the generator. Is that right? Right. So the logistics of doing that. So we, did, I mean, the generator was kind of an after fact because we have we couldn't use that material on the generator because it requires a strut. So we have excess material from the generator, which we're going to, do, which is the same as the rest of the screening. So we're, we have, so we're going to use that material here, and we have a different screening material around the generator, or a different way of securing. But long story short, in the front of the building, it'll look exactly the same as the existing material because it is yeah. the material. So I'd be comfortable delegating that to me. That would. Uh, the only thing to mention is that I do have a, a memo from the town engineer with respect to the changes of the drainage. Um, in terms of the elimination of the rain gardens, and I could read it, but it basically says he's fine with it. So uh, he says the as constructed drainage basins meets the intent requirements of section 6.9 of the zoning regulations. Okay. Questions? Comments? Yeah, I've got a question regarding the removal of the, uh, the bikeway. Why was that decided? There's, a, there's an ongoing plan, you know. People are looking at the overall. I think the town received a grant to look at the, the plan, and they're looking at, you know, a, a larger loop, not necessarily going through yeah. the park in this direction. Another plan. Yeah, there's a plan to do take the Sherling Greenway Trail sort of along Meadow Street, so it probably is a better route yeah, through Hammer Street. Field. And, and the plan of conservation Actually, and development and our transportation or TOD study, something like that. We included that as a nice kind of communication to Meadow Street. Um, yes, which I'm actually. Uh, 
in agreement with that concept. However, when this plan was developed, we're looking at the area of, you know, immediately surrounding the building, and the area of impact. Keep in mind, this is a 10 acre site. Once we started to get into what would be required to construct this, it was very clear right from the beginning. Then the impact that in, to, to construct this, we felt would have a, uh, a greater negative impact than an actual benefit of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, for instance, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Graham mentioned the impact to the established trees that are through here. You would also create a bike path right through a, a right on the edge of the playground that sits right here which is not shown on the plan again this is getting back to this is actually a 10 acre site um, as well as you created a pinch point uh, where the basketball court is in order to accommodate those gray changes that would recreate the uh, uh, construction of a retaining wall close proximity uh, to the um, basketball court which I feel the uh, uh, committee and reviewing that didn't think that was a uh, as well as the staff that was uh, um, a, you know the best you know, location then to do this again I've had discussions with uh, the town planner over this as well as the committee and really looking at how this overall um, as well as some of the neighbors I know we talked about reestablishing this these uh, the, the street uh, trees that are there and that uh, aesthetic look that this has been a neighborhood that has been impacted by some loss of trees over the years and anything we could do to be responsive and try to reestablish that I think is a benefit and also uh, uh, welcomed by the, the, the neighborhood um, as so again looking outside of that and making some pedestrian improvements uh, on this we know we have potential development uh, over here at the Atlantic uh, wire, uh, wire property we um, have uh, some secured some funding to um, do some improvements along Meadow Street. So there's a lot of activity that's happening. And I think to just you know, build this one piece, when we start to look at the big picture in the entire area, there's probably areas that are much more appropriate for this type of connection to occur with the site. So that's why we did it. It's not to eliminate what that Mm -hmm. plan of what we want to do. I'm in agreement with you. That's an important thing that has come out of a lot of studies that we've done. But this location isn't the best place to meet this. Let's look outside of this. You end up always walking your bike. Now. I do all the biking. And, I mean, and this, with all these jogs and all that's going on, you'd end up demounting and just probably walking your bike through here anyway. So you know, you're better off. You know, relocating it, elsewhere. it looked pretty good on paper when it first came in as part of it. Right. Yeah. And I recommended connecting it down to Meadow Street, but it was already in the thing. And when I'm looking out there at the way it's been developed and built, it, I can't even imagine how you would squeeze it in there. It's right. really tight. So I right. think this really isn't the ideal spot. I, I totally it, agree. I think and it just wants to go on the opposite side of the basketball yeah, court in the field and then you swing put it back almost over behind and there and you're going to accomplish yeah, that. Just and, one final yeah, comment on that, John. I think ultimately when we're trying to make this connection, you know, keep in mind this is uh, um, up here where you have Church Street, which has sidewalks on both sides and the connection there. So as far as pedestrian, you do have access to come onto that part of uh, uh, Meadow Street up to uh, the back side of the green. To Marcy's uh, point about perhaps traversing through the other side of this basketball court and through the pro uh, property in that direction, it would bring us closer to uh, the uh, corner of Hobson and Meadow, where I think that's where we're trying to get to in closer location to that. that. So condition two would actually uh, eliminate the conditions on the original approval that, man, you know, that required the path to be built and required the path to continue down to Meadow Street at some point in the future. So those elimination of those conditions would remove the path from this project. Okay. Any other questions or comments from anyone? Okay. Uh, I think then that we, uh, it's not a public hearing, so we, I think, oh, did we, we did waive the public hearing, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you waived the public hearing. Okay. Last so on the conditions, Harry, um, 
there's on number three. Yeah, number three, you could um, eliminate if you did not want to um, require that those two landscaping elements be put back. I mean, if you want to have some barrier, you could do a low berm. You could do propose a two foot high berm on that planting, you know, that island, and that would give some sort of visual separation from the parking lot and the street. Yeah. Whatever you do, you want it to be below its sight line. Oh, yeah. So if you yeah. did like yeah. a, you know, I mean, I'm just brainstorming. Yeah, I mean, you could totally, you could leave it. It's. Um, but I don't think there, it needs more landscape. There's a lot of landscaping going on, you know. <coughs> so some screenings will be provided by the trees going to be planted there, and, too. And so the trees, I think the trees will provide good screening, you know. So you could consider that sufficient, and that's up to you. Um, what do you, th uh, yeah, r right now, the what you put on here for discussion was that they have to put back the 28 junipers right and the inkberry right. plantings on the northern right. edge and uh, i'm torn i think the ink berries has been described at the hearing and it sounds like they're going to grow and they're going to be a maintenance issue with respect to sight lines so i don't think they probably are the the best choice. element uh, choice um and that there's a junipers versus white pine versus uh We'll respond in the future if we need to. <laughs> oh, the white, the, the white first? Yeah. Um, yeah, the uh, fur right. in here. Right. How does that drainage work through there? Uh, there's a detention basin in here. So, so if you go out there, it's kind of being low. fed from the parking? Or is it? Yeah, it's a, picking up some of the drainage. So nothing's going no. toward the street in that green strip? No. As far as drainage, it's not a swale or anything? No. So, so, so where were the 28 junipers that were being eliminated? Uh, they were basically right along the edge of the parking lot. Yeah. Um, you could put something like a line of 20 junipers or alternative acceptable to. I would put them on the property line personally. Because you're creating an artificial wall in the middle of your property that you want that green view shed to, the, to relate to the parking, you know, off the parking lot. And you'll still, the lights will go, still go into the junipers if that's the point of having them there. But I would just, put, you know, I just would plant towards the property line. Well, it doesn't sound like there's a drainage swell that's going to be interfered. Just plant them behind that that area. And, and what what do you think? Why, why do you want them? Uh, no, I, mean, want I think them. yeah, I think <laughs> so I think if we add, I mean, I think we, we've tried to capture the screen with with the, these six foot tall firs. They're going to get pretty big, pretty fast. Right. If, I mean, if anything, we might add more. But I think we felt this was adequate, and you know, as you know, as we actually now the parking lot's built, and we can yeah. like, you know, we'll see if there's a problem, if there's any complaints. We could add more and you know block them. But I think, you know, I, I don't think I don't think we really need another 28 shrubs in, in in this kind of you know tree. You know, we got a nice landscaping buffer. I think if we start putting too much there, it's just going to overwhelm the trees and just become a maintenance problem. Okay. So what do you think? Just uh, not needed. Not needed. And if we need something, we'll put it in because right. we're the town and the. Yeah, the you owners. know the owner. So. Right. <laughs> okay. So that means we would eliminate condition three, right? Okay. Okay. And then the proposed condition four could become the new condition three. Right. And can you read this. that one again? Uh, uh, replacement screening for the generator along the south side of the building shall be proposed for the review and approval good. of the town planner. Um, we should be advised by the town center revitalization review board. Okay. Okay. Are we, uh, everyone okay yep. with that? Yep. Okay. So then, is there a motion then to approve the application with the finding again? Looking on page, uh, what are we, page five of the staff report, with the finding of consistency uh, with the Coastal Man Area Management Act, the finding, and then the three conditions that we've discussed, one and two is written, we've eliminated three, and then the new number three, which is the replacement screening for the generators that Harry mentioned. So moved. So moved by Joe. Is there a second? Second. Second by Joe. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Thank you very much. Moving forward. Check your calendars for ribbon cutting. That's right. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay. Two. Next one, item number three is Northeast Foods LLC, 880 West Main Street. This is Burger King. Uh, someone here for that? Yep.
grab a mic if you like. Uh, uh, the reason why we're here, uh, we did a little change on the landscaping. When the act that did the plan, did the plan back in 2017, it was way too many plants. So we kind of modified a little bit. We did a kind of, you know, just a little draw and you know, present to the, to the town. And that's pretty much, that's why we're here. Okay, so we're here because of modification of landscaping? Modification of the landscaping commission is, uh, c can only do that, you know, more, rather than staff. Uh, this is Al Gomes, a uh, contractor for Burger King. Uh, so this has been a long process. I think they've bonded okay. for some we of the outstanding move. work, which would be the landscaping and some of sure. the striping. Okay. <laughs> uh, they've... Uh, they seek a waiver of the public hearing and also the requirement to utilize the landscape architect. Staff has been working with Burger King representatives and contractors to complete the project. A cash bond has been submitted to complete the remaining site work. The original landscape plan received on July 24, 2017 included the quantity of the proposed landscape plantings. The amount of plants included in that plan was excessive and did not allow for proper spacing or growth. So I, I think I included in there, so hopefully you can kind of get a gist of what's been re reduced, so. 145 ilexes. What's that? That's a, ton, that's a lot of. Yeah, I don't know. Sure. You know, I, I don't know what was the land. The original landscape plan was just, you know, way well, too excessive. Was it not prepared in the, by a landscape architect? Uh, is that what they're saying? I think it actually yeah, was. it was. It but, was. You know, who so knows you had the wrong going. scale drawing. That's yeah, possible. some something <laughs> something happened. So Al has gone back and and seen the reduction. I've I've ridden through. I rode through there uh, yesterday, and here's some photographs. It looks good, um, you know, uh, obviously, yeah, they're coming around. Um, so, um, really, um, I don't know if we need to go over all the, uh, all the various changes, but uh, I think the end result is that uh, the uh, plantings are in place at a reduced amount. And um, so uh, I think in terms terms of uh, the landscaping plan, I, I think it can be approved so we can move that on. And uh, you know, they still have an outstanding uh, you know, cash bond. So they'll be submitting that, I'm sure. So. Okay, great, thanks Rich. Yeah. Any questions from anyone? Okay, um, first thing off, I think uh, there's been a request that we waive the public hearing. And is there a motion to approve the waiver of the public hearing for this minor special exception modification to modify the landscape? So moved. So moved by Joe, is there a second? Second. Second, Marcy. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we waive the public hearing. And does anyone have any, qu any questions? If not, then do we uh, someone want to make a motion to approove the application? Excuse me. There's one other waiver, waiver oh, yeah. of the public, waiver of the site plan requirements because the plan has not been prepared, uh, the oh. modification has not been prepared by the professional, but he does have permission of the uh, engineer who prepared the plan to modify it and annotate it the way he's done it. Okay. So there's a motion hey, to waive the site plan requirements for by a landscape architect? Or yes. Okay. Is there a motion to waive the landscape architect requirement for a site? Moved by John. Is there a second? Yeah. I'm not approved. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody second this? Second by Joe. Further discussion? All in favor? Okay. I wanted to discuss it. <laughs> okay. I would say that the original plan was prepared by a landscape architect. Yeah. Probably done in the wrong scale, which is, would justify, because clearly the landscaper who put in the plants used good judgment. There we go. Which has nothing to do with the engineers. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sorry, any engineers out there. <laughs> then finally, does someone want to make a motion to approve the application with the two conditions in the staff report? The the ongoing man's ongoing maintenance of landscaping and the condition all prior conditions remain in effect. 
So moved. Moved by Marcy. Is there a second? Second. Second, Joe. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Congratulations. Okay, that was item number three. We are on to new business. First item is new business is Nest Shoreline Campus Fair at Stony Creek LLC, 56 Stony Creek Road. So we can take this, uh, Rich, can we grab the... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can even bring hamburgers. Yes. What, is that in the way? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. You can block it. Where, where does he want it? We're new. This this is uh. Okay. Okay. This is uh, our first time. First time using studio cameras. Yeah, right. I was. Absolutely. <laughs> is this the old Whitewood School? This is the old Whitewood School. Okay. We used to call it the Donkey School. Really? <laughs> you used to have a donkey on there, right? Really? I don't know that. Yeah, and I think we're not ready because you got to get a wetlands approval, right? Or they need some yes, one other uh, approval, but we're you're right. lining it up. Sorry. Give us some some background. <laughs> Where's the camera? <laughs> There's one over there and one over there. Two. Okay, uh, I guess you can go ahead. Okay, do I need to say my name and where? Sure, I live? absolutely. Please. So my name is Amy Small, and I live at 73 Sunset Beach Road in Brantford. My husband and I own um, the Nest Drawing Campus. It will be our fourth school. We opened up our first one 15 years ago in Hamden um, at the Colonial Times Restaurant in Hamden. Was our second re uh, school. And that was seven years ago. And then uh, Yale University had us come out to um, where Yale affiliated childcare in uh, on the Divinity School campus. And that was six years ago. So like I said, this will be our fourth school. All of them have been total gut remodels, some with additions, certainly not for this school. Um, but I am, and all of our schools are also NIAC accredited. Um, they will serve families with children from infants through kindergarten um, and we're open from 7 in the morning till 6 in the evening, Monday through Friday. Um, our school is very, very different than a typical daycare and if anyone wants any information on that, I have a microphone and I'm very passionate about early childhood education and if you'd like I mean, not to go into what makes us different or special, I will just introduce our architect, Chris Williams, who actually did two of our schools with us I'd in like the past. A brief synopsis. A brief? Okay. Because it's getting late, but I am interested. Yes. Um, so, let me go to my notes. So, um, we're progressive early learning school. Um, our curriculum is Reggio Emilia inspired. So without getting into the finer points of that, Reggio Emilia is basically um, a sister to its more well-known, his more well-known sister, Montessori. It's very similar to Montessori. Reggio Emilia is a town in Italy that got ravaged after World War II. And the townspeople, the aunts, the uncles, the grandparents, um, they all got together without most of the men and they <coughs> decided that they were gonna rebuild the town brick by brick. Um, for the benefit of the children. And through the years, it's become a remarkable um, model of early childhood education, and actually they bring it all the way up through, um, through high school. Um, and even today, it become, uh, Reggio Emilia Italy is a mecca for early childhood um, educators to go and see how they do it in Italy and how to bring it back um, to the states with, and, and do it uh, inspired. Uh, like the way they do there. Um, the one thing about Reggio Emilia is they say that the, um, the educator is the third teacher, so environments are really, really important. Um, they don't believe that children should be in basements and um, lots of light, large spaces, and it should be beautiful and intentionally set up for the children. And we've done that in all of our schools and, and have gotten um, a lot of uh, attention uh, because of that. Um, NEST is actually an acronym 
Um, it's nature inspired, uh, emotionally responsive, science informed, and transform transforming early education. So nature inspired basically how that our, we go outside every single day regardless of the weather. So even if it's 10 degrees, we go outside. The kids have special outfits, uniforms, it's called Oki wear, and they're covered from their head to their toes. And I think if there's a decision to be made whether we go outside or not, it's are we staying in, not are we going out. We're outside constantly. Um, uh, our outdoor spaces are just like our indoor spaces are very large. Um, there's no plastic toys anywhere. It's all nature, which this particular site makes a great spot for us for that kind of ethos at our school. Um, emotionally responsive, that's a whole big thing you might not want to hear right now. Um, but grab me later and I'll be happy to tell you about it. Um, science informed, um, that has to do with um, the belief that play is the best way to teach children or play based. Um, we're really careful of um, uh, implicit bias and our food program. So that's another big thing for our school. Um, our schools have big commercial kitchens in them and it's right in the middle of the school so they walk by and you can see the chef and our children eat real food every day a lot of it's organic a lot of it's local um, and nothing is processed every single thing from the soup stocks to the sauces to the wraps they're all made by hand and it costs us a lot of money to do that but we feel that it's really really important and um, our children's afternoons, so we serve a morning snack, which kind of looks like breakfast, but it's a snack, and then lunch, and then an afternoon snack. And um, the afternoon snack could be roasted Brussels sprouts, asparagus. We don't give um, substitutions, and it's just, it's just really an incredible place. Very different. There's nothing on the shoreline like it, except for us in Hamden, New Haven. Any questions? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Chris. Hope you all had a chance to have dinner before you came here tonight. Sorry. Um, Chris Williams, architect, 85 Willow Street in Haven, Connecticut. And um, I'll just go through the uh, plan quickly. <clears throat> So the idea here is that uh, the building is the subject of the renovation. The site is intended to pretty much remain as is. Uh, the, <clears throat> the whole concept behind uh, this uh, development is that where we're using an existing site and transforming the building to suit uh, the school. So we have here an aerial view of the existing site to show what the existing landscaping and vegetation looks like. Superimposed on that is the uh, parking so it reads better and the uh, footprint of the existing building. Below here is what the site will be with some minor modifications, mostly in response to licensing requirements for the operation of the facility largely is fencing, egress paths around the building, <coughs> exit access, and uh, play areas that are separated by a four foot high fence from the outside world. Uh, the parking uh, area will remain the same. The, can you hear me with this? Sorry. Yeah. The uh, entrance and exit from the parking lot, curb cuts are all exactly the same. There's some modifications here to provide an outdoor play area and a driveway uh, pretty much requested by the fire the marshal to access around the building. <clears throat> There's an existing one, uh, one family dwelling, two stories high, that will be demolished. And there's an existing barn that will be retained, uh, you can see in the photograph here. So a new fence will be put up along the road, four foot high wood fence, chain link fence in the back, a fence to connect the school, with the back fence, so that anywhere where the children are outside, they, uh, uh, they're fenced in. 
new dumpster enclosure will be added at the end. So the site changes are, are minimal. One of the important things that will happen here is uh, phasing. Uh, because the uh, center is going to, or the school is going to open, part of it's going to open in September. So currently there's a building permit to renovate the interior of the building on the right side here. The, the, basically the plan of the building, which I'll show you, is in two halves, uh, bisected by an entrance area that cuts through the entire school, entire building. <clears throat> Existing fence and play area on that side uh, will remain, be used by the children in this part that's currently being renovated. No exterior renovations are proposed yet. However, once uh, this application is approved, we're going to submit plans to renovate the other side, which we call phase two. Phase one will be occupied, separated by temporary fencing. Uh, phase two will be renovated, and then once that's complete, phase three will begin, and it'll flip-flop, <coughs> and the right side that we currently are renovating will be further renovated to include the exterior modifications that you see in the rendering that I had up before, and you have before you in the handout, and um, <coughs> The, uh, the second floor will also be included in that part of the information. You can see here the floor plans of when it will be completed. Uh, the entrance will remain in the same location that it is now. We're changing <coughs> interior partitions, interior uh, stairways. We're removing some exterior stairs that are on the back of the building and putting them inside, making it safer. Uh, right now, uh, they're not really compliant where they are. Uh, we're making this classroom bigger. Right now it's two, it will be one. And then this entire open space area to the left will be um, a series of classrooms and offices for the central gym-like space, oval space. That all leads to outside, to the great uh, outside area that's mm -hmm. on the south, or the west part of the site. <clears throat> These are exterior elevations. We're changing virtually every window in the place. Uh, we're also going to uh, enhance the existing wood siding that you can see in the rendering. Uh, some of the colors that we're thinking about. Still kind of under study, but that's basically the look and the finishes that we're going for on the exterior. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, if you have any questions. Great, thanks. Uh, Harry or Rich, do you have any comments about this? Well, I think uh, Mr. Williams uh, um, did some fast work on the, uh, uh, on the drawings and elevations elevations and uh, so I think uh, basically he ex explained uh, the concept for the uh, the phasing inside and basically we're looking at this to I guess it, ne it needs to be approved by the inland wetlands uh, group um, to commission to uh, which meet on the 8th uh, of um, August 8th and so I think we've set a special meeting for the 12th to go over th to go over the, uh, the the plan again and um, and act on it. Um, we're we're struggling a little bit with the with the parking just based on it. it's interesting. There's no school uh, you know code. There's no uh, school uh, entry in the uh, parking. You know the total parking spaces in terms of. The parking so, but the parking table uh, does allow uh, on section 6.5D allows the commission to consider other parking requirement sources. So we'll we'll try to you know pull up uh, you know what we've used in the past or what would be the most um, uh, relevant. Um, so uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I believe there's 36 parking spaces. 34. 34. Uh, two of which are uh, accessible parking spaces. 
look at handicap. Yeah. Based on okay. So that's, a that, that's what you used in the past too, uh, you know, for some of the other uh, uh, branches. And uh, the branch in, in, at Yale really didn't have parking on the site. I'm not sure what you used elsewhere in Camden. It was um, where the zoning had more of a child care. So. Yeah. One space for every two employees. Yeah. One. So, so, employees so, so your regulations call for six spaces for every, uh, one space for every six students. Students. If um, it's but none of the students drive. They get dropped right, off right. in the morning and picked up in the afternoon. Uh, and then one space for every staff member. And I'm assuming that's one space for every staff member at the center at the same time. Okay. So we're pretty close. Yes, uh, I would believe you are. Are the drop-off times staggered? I mean, if yeah. you've got 120 parents with needing to park and walk their kids in, that seems like no. it went three waves or something. So we're open from 7 to 6, and they trickle in between 7, um, 8, 30, 9 o'clock. It gets a little bit busier. Um, but they come in all different times, and they leave all different times from 3 to 6 and from 7 to 9.30. So because it's open-ended, you don't see the parking lot getting over? No, never. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the site is, uh, you know, obviously well-suited for you know, the continuance of a, of a school like this, and so there's outdoor play areas, as, uh, as they've stated. Um, the reports from uh, East Shore Health District was, uh, was a key uh, that <coughs> allowed them to uh, repair the septic system uh, with the conditions that was, and I think that was attached to the uh, handout that you have. So, um, Harry, you got anything else on that? Yeah, just a couple of uh, other things and quite focus on. Um, one is the landscaping, so there is a, uh, an aerial, I think, Rich attached to the staff report that shows there's a fair amount of landscaping along um, uh, Stony Creek Road. Um, to comply with the regulations, it really needs to be documented that they rely on existing vegetation. And it's an existing site, so it's not. And you could also look at it as, you know, what's the extent practicable standard in terms of bringing it into full compliance. I mean, I think existing landscaping does screen and soften. The building as it appears from Stony Creek Road and there's quite a bit of landscaping around it that's natural vegetation that's in the side and rear yards and the train tracks about the uh, the east side of the property uh, the only other piece of information missing at this point that's still being developed I understand is a lighting plan um, in terms of the external fixtures on the building and I don't think anything's being proposed for the parking lot for Pole lighting, you just... We're working with working a okay. uh, rep to lay out lighting in the parking lot and on the building, and we can submit photometrics as a condition of the approval. Yeah, that could be handled, I think, cut. as a condition. That's yeah. been done okay. often in the past. Um, so at this point, as Rich mentioned, um, uh, commission by state law is prohibited from acting on this and approving it before uh, the wetlands, in the wetlands, more courses agency acts on it. So we have to wait. So is there anything that needs you recommend the applicant do or, or revise before we vote on this? I think we can handle the outstanding mm. landscaping light without conditions. And yeah. I don't really yeah. think there's anything else that uh, okay. we can't handle with conditions. You think you'll handle, you'll get the parking worked out? <laughs> um, yes, I, I do. Uh, and uh, uh, so we'll, we'll have some good examples of that. I don't know what we used for the, uh, it's a different scale, of course, with the uh, uh, intermediate school. Uh, well, my uh, other question would be, how many teachers are parking there at any given time? You said you have um, 30 staff, but. So, oh, that's a maximum one, shift. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. About 17 or 18. So the, roughly half the spaces are available for pick up and drop off, and if it's staggered over a two hour time period, Plus, what I came yeah. up to say is that um, I don't think I mentioned that probably over a third 
of our families have multiple children. Oh. So, mm -hmm. so that changes yeah. the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I was just reading the septic. It had a conditional approval. Is that something that needed to be? Yeah, it was it's conditional to for the repair of the, uh, the septic system. With other conditions, let's yeah. see what else is out. Okay, so at this point we can waive the public hearing, but that's all we can do, right? Yeah, right. Is there a motion to waive the public hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All favor? Aye. Okay, so then this will be, we'll have a special meeting probably August 12th. Is that what we're yes. looking at? Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll uh, consider it then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to item number two of new business, which is Finelli Electric Contracting LLC, which is uh, Cedar Park, yeah. 131 North Main, I think I have. Yes, uh, I don't know that anyone uh, could make it, but this is fairly simple and something that in the future we can hopefully just do by uh, approve the uh, staff. But it's a um, existing apartment complex on North Main Street <clears throat> that has a lot of not had a, non, a lot of non-compliant lighting, so um, they've changed it out to the kind of the lollipop style the way I look at them, uh, pole lighting lamps, and they're putting in uh, code-compliant uh, fixtures. Um, and uh, so that, that's simply all it is. It's uh, there are five 12 foot pole lights and three bollard lights. So, total of eight. Um, so, the LED uh, sidewalk bollard lights um, have the, the right rating, and so everything is, uh, in, you know, I, I think. Uh, the, what they've suggested and put forward is uh, our, you know, uh, code compliant lighting. So I think just the conditions of previous approval and um, just another of uh, the replacement lighting shall be installed without planning and condition approval or that of the staff, whichever may be appropriate for compliance of the proposed signage or lighting with the zoning regulations. It's an older building in need of uh, upgrade. Okay. And it also has a special exception modification, so we received a request to waive the public hearing, which you need to vote on as well. Great, no. thanks. Is there a motion to waive the public hearing for this? So Second. Second. For discussion, all in favor? Aye. Okay, public hearing waived. There's a motion to approve the application with the two conditions in the staff report. So moved. Motion made, is there a second? Second. Second by give it to Joe. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So that uh, brings us to item number three. Scott Avine, 698 Main Street, special exception modification ad portico. Yes. Good evening. I apologize, one of my first uh, uh, meetings with the, the commission. If you need me to uh, put the blueprint on the board for you, I can. Uh, basically, this is a modification to the existing um, site plan uh, for Sachem Capital, 698 Main Street. Um, the original design had a, uh, a cloth canopy uh, at the entry door, um, and the revised proposed plan included with the application um, changes that to a portico um, constructed uh, but stands out about five feet from the brick building uh, stands on two white columns eight inches round um, in addition to that the, the original site plan had a sidewalk that was non-compliant um, the Commission had requested that it be set back further uh, that uh, new setback on the sidewalk is also included with the site plan Great. Um. I'm confused. So the site was going back to the original approval location? Mm, correct. Okay. All right. And this went before the town center 
It went before yeah. the town center. Um, yep. And they had essentially no no problems networks. with this. Um, uh, uh, and so that was that was completed. Um, and uh, I just noticed today it looks like you're getting moving the sidewalk back. Um, they they did pull out the old sidewalk yeah. um, in yeah. anticipation uh, of the uh, hearing. In terms of uh, the actual plan itself, so it's not changing. The sidewalk location will remain as was originally approved, as well as the curb line. They're just fixing what they did in the field. This shows a sign. Are we approving the sign? Yes, to sign sign and location, the variance. Yeah. The variances were uh, received for the sign and the uh, portico. So that's included in this, so they don't have to come back to do the sign? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? No, I think that was, you know, that's it's it. pretty straightforward, and hopefully we can uh, wrap this one up, too. Uh, they, have, they've, uh, they have a large cash bond, so I'm sure they'll be coming in uh, soon, September, for a uh, reduction in the uh, bond amount. Okay. Uh, did I say once again? Uh, he's seeking public hearing waiver. Great. Questions for anyone? Nope. Motion to waive the public hearing. So moved. Moved by Whatever. Marcy, second by John. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion to approve the application. Condition that all conditions of the previous approvals remain in full and force and effect as they still apply. So moved. Mo motion by Joe. For, is there a second? Second. Second, Marcy. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations. Thank you for your time. You bet. Okay, item number four, 1064 Main Street. That's the uh, China Garden, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, there was a condition on the original approval that um, when they had uh, developed their assigned proposal that they would have to come back and have it approved because it's really you no know, building on staff's part to do that at the moment. Um, so they have done that. Um, I think Rich has done a little... Right. Yeah, we, I did the, the well, I showed the, uh, the notice of decision, and then basically we're using, uh, this was, it shows, uh, second page shows the, uh, the sign board and the, uh, so it's a dark green and uh, let, uh, gold lettering that's been used on that whole building there, so it looks good. Uh, the town center uh, was, uh, had no problems with it, or thought it was a, Fitting uh, sign for the for the building, so we're just recommending approval. Okay, yep. no no waiver of public hearing. It's a site uh, plan, right? So we don't need a public hearing. No, because it's it's site plan, right? Yeah. Okay. And no conditions. No conditions. Nope. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the application? So moved. So moved. Marcy, is there a second? Second, Joe. Further discussion. All favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. More stuff to Chinese food downtown here, right? Hey, it's not ice cream. Right. <laughs> it's not real estate office. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, number five, informal review of conceptual plan for Summit Place. Is, uh, I don't see anybody representing this in attendance. I know they knew the date of the meeting, so I did not check in with them. Um, so, so I we'll, suggest we table this until September. Okay. okay. We will uh, table item number five in, in the absence of an applicant. So. Brings us to item number six, discussion presentation, proposal for a limited BL hybrid zone. Mr. Mancini. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the commission. My name is John Mancini. I'm a principal with BL Companies, uh, 355 Research Parkway, uh, Meriden, Connecticut. Um, with me are the owners, uh, Jeffrey and Chris Shapiro, of uh, two parcels of land that are located on Commercial Parkway, uh, opposite where Walmart is. Um, we're here just because we, we have had this uh, probably four to five month discussion going back and forth with Harry, who's been really helpful, about what can we do to um, sort of bring finally uh, some fruit to this property. We, we have had this uh, 
ongoing series of delays, uh, starting with the Amtrak bridge, uh, approvals that have elapsed because we, we wouldn't have been able to get our state approvals. Uh, more recently, in 2013, the bridge was open. The capacity at that particular point on Route 1 is now there. Uh, last year, uh, a, a, the, the town as well as cr local council of governments had commissioned a study that was done on what the improvements would need to be um, at that interchange. The underlying problem with exit 53 is it's not a full interchange. Um, that's the mechanics of the way traffic works there. The other problem is, is we have an economy that um, really uh, we've missed the boat on any big retail boxes that might have been able to go in this BL zone. So what we've seen over the last um, year and a half to two years is this really good success story happening at exit 56 where this many of these, um, I'll call it, you know, simple butler type buildings are being occupied by lots of good businesses. Some are, I'll call it, semi-retail related, some are service oriented, uh, some are restaurants, some are breweries. Regardless, it's vibrant, there's people, there's tenants, there's occupancy. So at this interchange, we're simply faced with the reality of, we have this BL zone as written, and we are at one of four major interchanges. Yet, the type of tenants that are calling the owners, um, some are not allowed in this zone. So what we had an idea for is to create something called a BL hybrid. And really it was to allow, I think, three, only three uses that are currently not allowed uh, under, uh, by special exception. And I have a, a quick draft of that to pass out. So, um, so what I tried to do, Mr. Chair and members of the commission, is make it simple. I, we have the official document page from the regs, and then behind it is what we would do. <clears throat> so, for instance, this regulation called BLH-H for a hybrid district. Um, in addition to the purpose that is in for the BL, um, it would be also to accommodate some commercial uses under these circumstances. So for instance, at one of these four interchanges, if they were to adopt this BLH, um, if you had a lot area that was roughly, say, four acres in size, Again, to try to help, like, if you think of all of our exits, 54, there's properties around 54 near the interchange that are being underutilized that are larger in size. 55, um, let's just only hope that new things happen there um, at some of the bigger properties. They're just really underutilized and really kind of past their time. 56 has some vacant properties but at least the properties that were developed are thriving because of some of the uses are being allowed, quite frankly, through either the building permit process or the zoning process. And 
I think the town has done a good job of allowing that type of mixed use in that IG2 zone. So what we're saying is that um, only the items in pink really is a revised um, item of text to the regulation. And as it relates to the table of uses, the only uses we would be adding is our version of page 49, which is near the end, and that is items 62, 64, and 69. We would be allowed to have those uses in this regulation, section BL-H, as a special exception. What, what page is that on? It's um, our current reg page 69. They're what? not numbered, unfortunately. No. Yeah, at the bottom. Item 69? No, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's... Um, so it's oh, under 50. storage related and industrial? Is that yeah, what it's, it's um, I'm sorry, 49, my bad. Okay. Oh. 49. 49. So self-storage, assembly, manufacturing, and warehousing, and wholesale. Correct. So um, fortunately for my business, um, I've been lucky to work for... FedEx and Amazon, as an example, and we're we're working on logistics type pro projects right now that are buildings that are not that they're just not that big. There's a curtain. There's a certain function to the building, and there's a certain uh, use of the building, and they're warehouse type buildings, but they're not these massive buildings. What we're saying is, is the buildings that are at exit 56, they're of a certain era. With the special exception, we know that it's an interchange and we would have to do a nice uh, building. Special exception allows you guys to critique the type of building for these extra uses. And there's only, like I said, less than a handful that we're um, thinking of proposing for this use. The underlying reason for this request is that what we're proposing is the needed type of uses that have less traffic. This is a broken traffic area. To put retail in the BL zone that is very high intense trip generation just doesn't work. We've gone down the path of studying this area for years and the major fix is a full interchange. That fix of changing both Route 1 as well as the interchange is in the realm of $20 million. There's no big user out there these days that can actually pay even a fraction of that. And that's really the issue. So what we want to do is how do we get the property behind us, for instance, where the bowling alley was and those businesses back alive, how do we get this site to be not paying over $100,000 in taxes a year and not have anything on it, and yet deal with the traffic? So these types of uses would require some improvements, but not the grandiose improvements that, let's say, um, uh, a major traffic generator would need if they went on that site. Um, is this a new zone? So we think you would be rezoning this from BL to BLH? Well, that's a good question, Chuck. So not being the lawyer, I'm not sure that that's what we're saying. I think what we're saying is, is um, we're allowing for this new BLH zone to exist in places where BL is, so you have to have a BL zone and you have to have, for instance, four acres of land. Now, we talked about putting more controls, like you have to be within a certain distance of the interchange, and I think in good dialogue with Harry, there was some concern about limiting how far off the interchange you come. But this is really a problem at these interchanges. So um, we don't have the answers. So the reason why sure. we came here tonight was we were welcoming your input. It's a workshop. 
nothing's binding, it's 10 o'clock at night. So one of the things that we talked about was perhaps if you guys have any ideas, you can email Harry. Um, but we want to soon come in with some type of project on this site. And right now the tenant mix that is allowed under BL isn't working for us. And, and your, your concern is these two parcels, right? The two parcels opposite Walmart? That's yeah, but, okay. but this could be used on any parcel that is a BL zone. Right. My, my, my reaction is the additional uses you're allowing, I have no problem with, I mean, the benefits are there's less traffic generation, um, they're um, economic positive for the town, <laughs> um, and, and those are good things. That said, they're not particularly, you, you don't want them right at interchange. <laughs> you don't want a self-storage or, or warehouse or whatever. Yeah. You, and, the, and your two parcels aren't necessarily right by the interchange. You're, right. You gotta go up a ways, you know? Yeah, and Chuck, great, great point. One of the problems why these sites aren't good retail sites is we're not on the main thoroughfare. We're on a dead end. Right. And what happens is if the full interchange doesn't get fit, one of the fixes one of the net effects of the fix of the interchange is when we would run the ramp down Commercial Parkway, it became frontage for the retailers. It's just not gonna happen. There's nobody that has right. that kind of money. And, and clearly the state has said, they've spent their money on this area of Bramford already. They've told us that in a lot of different ways. They spent millions on the bridge. The beginning of the Q Bridge project was this interchange, and thirdly, they already spent money at 54. They're, they're moving on to other parts of the state. Sure, yeah. And so. I mean, and also self-storage facilities, I mean, aren't the most aesthetically <laughs> playing. No, <laughs> and, and, and in fairness though, I will say like, we got um, them already. You, special exception, and there's right. other controls with the self-storage yeah, as but, well. Yeah, but that's what I think, you, your parcels aren't really right, you don't no. go right into the town and no. you can see your right. parcels that you're talking about, so. Right. Yeah. And, well, really all I will say is that you know, I'm a resident of the town too, and, and when you drive down the industrial area, um, that, that area of 56, um, maybe it's the brewery, maybe it's the other type of businesses, maybe it's the medical office, maybe it's the research and development, but there's never any traffic problems, you know? There's never any, um, but there's also no vacancy, and, and it's productive, it's a very productive area. Yeah, helps so, our taxes, right? Yeah. <laughs> we like it. Um, I, Mr. Chair, um, Jeff sure. and Chris, would you like to come up and speak? <laughs> Thank you for your time. Big space compared to one. Hi, I'm Jeff Shapiro. I'll keep it short. I just want to say that you know we've been trying to develop this property for retail uses for years. Uh, we had stop and shop there for a while. Then uh, Ceruzzi had this pie in the sky idea that he was going to build a 400,000 square foot uh, retail development there. That, and, and it seems like a big retail development, the ship has sailed. I mean, we, we see that, you know, shopping malls, there's lots of empty stores. Exit 56, there isn't. You know, small specialized places seems to be where it's at. And it, you know, what we've been trying to do there for years We've been trying to do since my dad was my age. And I'm, we just want to get something going there so that it, we don't end up in a situation where my son is my age by the time we actually start doing something. So we're no. just, we're just we, we want, at first we figured the best idea was to change to IG2, just go for an industrial use and, and give up on retail altogether. But then it was brought out to us by Harry that, you know, well, if, if IG2 would allow us to put a junkyard there, you know, it would allow us to put a contractor yard there and certain things. So he said, well, let's just try to limit it to what we think will really is feasible and, sure. and, and would not be offensive. So that, that's what we've come up with is, sure. is this. And that, that's it. We have been going back and forth quite a while now. And I wish there was a more efficient way to do this. Um, as everyone's talking, I'm thinking, you know, this, and I think something you said, Chuck, sort of rang in my head. This, this property really is different, I think, than some of the other properties that the steering committee was looking at the POCD in terms of when they were thinking about the hybrid zone, they are really thinking, I think, more visible properties right near the interchange where they wanted some design review 
additional design review uh, considerations put in place as part of the hybrid zone. I think maybe it makes sense to have a hybrid zone for more out of the way properties, if you will, that are, don't, don't have the visibility, them. don't have access to the main thoroughfares, and then at frontage, and frontage, and then at some point we could come also develop maybe a BLH2 or something that deals with those properties that are more visible, right. that need the design review guidelines because that's what was envisioned by the steering committee. Let's look at the highway interchanges and make them more attractive and appealing as you come to the community so that gives the, you know, the a better, you know, appearance and mm -hmm. better uh, impression to people coming into the town. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking um, I'd like to try and propose something, work with uh, uh, sure. the Shapiro's and, and John, and um, maybe we can come up with something during August while we're not having commission meetings that um, would be more limited in how it's applied. I'm thinking probably like an overlay zone or a floating zone or something that even ends, a rezone. I don't know how to. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't zone two properties separately. Unfortunately, it'd probably be spot zoning. But no, I don't know. I'd like to it's see still, where all the how many acres are total. Uh, so the the total of the two parcels are like 22 and a half acres. I don't yeah, know. I think that's big. big enough to avoid right. that. But yeah. but yeah, I don't. We'll know. But, it, but we'll yeah. figure yeah. that out. Yeah. 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 So does that make sense? I mean, that's my thought yeah, about it. Unique, it's, that's a unique, it's a unique spot. Yeah. 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 And it's like, like you just said, it's it's it's, it's off. It's yeah. In the back there, where right. it's not visibly. No, but it could be very productive if it had the right zoning. I think. Marshall I think that's Marshall exactly Marshall. right. Yeah. And that, there's another. Who knows what's beyond that? I'm right. Back well, oh. so Joe's right. I mean, there's eight and a half acres that Ceruzzi's family still owns. He passed away. That's the old bowling alley, and there's a few productive businesses, but some that are run down. And then there's the Saks land, that's another four and a half, almost five acres behind it. And I, I think maybe that's what we're getting at, is that like the irony of this whole area was, this is where Jeff's dad had his shirt factory for years, right? Um, they came from downtown, and they went up there. It was being used for these types of things. Yeah, like yeah, in-shape yeah. gym was there, right? Uh, there was a retail there, and then there was also warehousing. So it's kind of funny. What we're trying to do is recapture um, what we had almost. There was 100 and I think just under 200,000 square feet of building on the property. Unfortunately, when we were permitting for Stop and Shop and Home Depot at that time, there was a fire in the building and the building had to come down um, and it turned out to be uh, that there were squatters and some homeless people right. that I remember that <laughs> so, so it, yeah. it's strange you would think right across from Walmart would be a great retail site but if it hasn't worked for 15 years I guess you know yeah I mean it never worked no it's the no. traffic yeah. And and just because we got picked on a little and this commission was really helpful with Costco at exit 56, I have to say up until, I want to just tell you how creative this family is, up until six months ago, Jeff asked me for the highest level contacts at Costco in Virginia and he and his wife um, videotaped how long it would take to get from 54 to this site to try to prove to Costco that the half interchange would work. <laughs> and we got the real estate committee to actually drive the site and they said no for like the eighth time. But, <laughs> but it was a new approach. Nice try, nice so try. I'm like, let's try it. Like, you know, like maybe they have some empathy, you know, I don't know. So, okay. Amazon just kind of killed the retail business. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I would like to reiterate to something that I spoke about often in the POCD meetings is, you know, we always hear this linear retail development along Route 1 and how to, you know, I, I would just like to see the nodes be recognized as nodes at the interchange right. and right. and not. And, right. you know, so for something like this, I'd like to see where are all the BL properties, yeah. you know, and in town, you know, and I mean, I, I kind of look from the big picture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to a future discussion, but... definitely bring the zoning maps so you can, you know. Right. You know, and if there were a chance, you know, does this this idea 
transition back if the state ever does find twenty million to do those interchange? Does yeah. it, does it trans is that, that best Marcy, that's a back? that's a wonderful point. We could even begin the development of our twenty two acres in a way mechanically so that the lands needed for any alteration can stay available. So and you know we can ascribe that on a map for you guys. So we get that because the study was done. We thought of that already. I do want to recognize um, Mr. Chair that um, we had reached out to Phil and thank you Phil for coming. I know he was um, part of uh, the chair process of the breakout committee for looking at this stuff as well as other things in town. And uh, we actually had lunch with Tim because we want, we're, we're really serious about trying to do something and we wanted his input. And uh, I also want to take, uh, thank the selectmen and, and the um, REM folks in the audience because I know they've been paying attention to this interchange as well. Great, so. thanks. Yeah. Uh, anyone else want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, Marcy and I, we all sat together on the POCD for a year, and uh, one of the things that just constantly came up is, is allowing more flexibility in these nodes, as Marcy calls them, uh, the interchange nodes, and allowing, you know, a nice development, but something that's maybe a little different than, you know, what the zone actually allows. And the mixed use, you know, just allowing it not only you know talking about other 56 but all the different interchanges and and each one is very unique you know 55 is a very visible place where you really want that to be attractive when people get on and off the highway this particular spot is impacted by the highway but it's it's like a dead end up in the up in the corner so it's again if we have more flexibility we can, we can come up with better uses that are still attractive, but also allow them to do things that are viable. And, and you got the DOT thing, which is just a big storage area, big mounds yeah, of fill yeah. and junk and whatever. You, know, whatever. you get to go right by there. So. I also want to say part of the whole POSP is as economic development, we encourage use other than the um, retail at 53, sure. 54, and 55. And that was part of what, what you know, Phil and his, his group came up with. We are currently, have been talking with Connecticut Bio, and they um, are looking for additional areas. This, as we, as we talked about before, is an ideal spot for companies that are affiliated with Yale to come on and off the exit, because that's the way those exits are designed. They're not designed to go out the so anything that we can do to encourage that will, will you know, be a good way for, for that property to be built nicely. Sure. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You bet. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's item number six, and we go on to other business. It never ends, guys. Oh, there's still another <sighs> Number two. Uh, interpretation of the definition of a sign, lack of a definition of basement. Yeah, this is related uh, to a couple of uh, pending zoning permits and our, I won't say new, uh, uh, zoning enforcement officer Jamie Frederick is uh, in attendance and will mm. explain her dilemmas and how to interpret uh, these two items. Jamie, come on up. Um, so I've kind of had a question about the sign um, definition and what constitutes a sign as far as requiring a sign permit. Um, we don't take sign permits for signage inside of windows, um, but signage on site, like circulation signage, we have a section that speaks to that, but we don't have anything that really speaks to signage on site that's not really necessarily intended to be read off site outside of directional signage. Um, so I guess my question is whether visible from any street or from any lot other than the lot in which the sign is located is whether the sign is physically visible or whether it's legible from off site. You know, do you have an example what, what, that, that you had this dilemma? Um, so like with outdoor sale, uh, merchandise 
um, sometimes we'll have signs out or like a gas station um, sign by the pump. Not necessarily intended to be read from off site, but it's, you know, structural, stru structurally it looks like a sign. It has writing on it. Um, does it require a sign permit? Okay, and, and part of it is the definition of, uh, and, and you're being a good zoning enforcement officer, say, what do the regs say? And you yeah, look and at the definition. Had a copy of the definition prepared for everybody, so you should have a copy of that. Do we have that somewhere? That's yeah, it. a little handout with, uh, I think the first page says section 2.2 .2 at the top. And there's a couple other, there's like three pages to it. That's okay. Um, okay. Here we go. Which one's the best? Oh, I think so. Okay, so the, the, the question, the definition here, it says sign means every sign, blah, blah, blah has to be visible from any street. And your question is, you may be able to see the thing, but you can't read it. Correct. And, and does that count as a sign? And I guess the, the distinction being that it's intended for the on-site, but it's still visible off-site, but you can't read it. So I suppose that's, that's the question. Is that a sign, and do they need a sign permit? And well, you probably, might be able to even read it from the sign, from the street, but it's not intended to be read from the street. I mean, alternatively, the fixture could still be put there without anything on it, um, and would it be a sign at that point? So, I mean, at that point, it wouldn't be, you know, something you could read from the street, but it would still be visible from the street. So. Well, the word in the reg says visible from the street. Yeah. Um, you know, but, and that to me means visible. That said, maybe we shouldn't regulate it. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I think there's the intention of the regs of, you know, what, what does the business want visible from the street? And if the business who's putting the sign out wants it visible, then it should be regulated. If it's something that's meant to be facilitate something on site, Still may be signage like directional signage on site, but I don't. I don't know that we should be regulating it. If well, it's going to be advertising to be a sign anyway. <clears throat> What's that? I think it's going to be advertising in nature. It can't be just merely directional. So. So if it's advertising something, I mean, do we? You're saying do we? If it's visible from the street, I think we've gone back and forth a little so bit. So are we in regulating of how we sandwich this, boards? But that are all along Main Street? Uh, theoretically, Do yes. they constitute signs? Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I this they is do. the... They are, yeah. This is the, you know, so the like elephant in the room. Yeah, signs. yeah. That's well, true. Outside, outside use internal signs, but are not average. I'm confused about what she's saying. She said, what? like, gas signs on the, side, uh, on the gas pump. Not on the gas pump, but, like, near a gas pump. Um, like sometimes you see something, you know, they get the plastic strips and they'll put, you know, milk a dollar eighty nine or whatever it is next to the top of the gas pump or whatever they're selling. And some of those signs you could see from the street or off property and well, some of them might be located yeah. in such a way that you can only see it if you pull it into the pump. Right. Right. So move them so you can't see them from off <laughs> <laughs> They get the that's, ones that can't be seen, or they get the ones that can't. If you can only see them on site, uh, not off site. I, 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 I point of the sign if you strong. can't see it. <laughs> that, I that, think that, the point is, at what point is too much signage becoming yeah. not well, attractive? I, 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 that, that's the underlying that thing as well. That's probably a good example of that. But first, it's just one of my pet peeves of definitions from all the way back on the ASTM terminology committee for E6 was a definition shall not include the word being defined in the definition. Okay. So a sign includes every sign. So it's just one of those Redundant. formative <laughs> things that just make me nuts. But I, that's, that's okay. beside the point. Duly noted. But the yeah. gas station is a good example because you have a gas station sign, the, you know, the, the brand of the gas, 
And then you've got the booth that has you know, cheapest cigarettes everywhere, anywhere, and you've got product behind the glass, and you've got any number of colorful, graphic, glyphic representations intended to communicate. And while it may be visually chaotic, it's also what you expect for a gas station or a convenience store. So I mean, it's it's I, it's it's the degree to which you want to regulate something like that is is yeah. difficult and probably futile. Yeah, and I think every community struggles with this, and they come up yeah. with their own, you know, balancing act. And do we have the perfect one? I'm sure we don't. Um, but at this point, I think for purposes of tonight, we probably do need to go through. And I, in my previous incarnations, um, it's always difficult overhauling sign regulations because it's just a lot of people very interested in what it's going to allow me to do and not do. And that just makes it very difficult to keep a broader picture, I find, in terms of what is good for the community and what's good for the property. I wasn't trying to strike a balance between all that, and it just gets to be very difficult. That all that aside, uh, for the purposes of tonight, I think Jamie's really interested in what do you think it says now? <laughs> and what, yeah. what should she be doing with this application she's got in front of her? So. Well, I would focus on signs on buildings and signs that identify buildings. Like well, we did for the, the China. Visible, so what? You know, I mean. What does that mean? I think it means it's, visible. So if you can see it, it's a sign. Well, I, I think okay. it's, yeah, I think okay. it uh, means but, every sign visible from any street. Well, I'm, look, I'm focusing on the intention of the sign, the signs that identify the user or the use as opposed to. Well, we can't get into content. We can't get into so regulating. So like visible from the street is, is to try to draw people from the street with right. that sign. Because yeah. you can see signs, you can feel, you, I mean, that visual from the street. That's, yeah, that's billboards are signs. We exclude stuff that's inside a building, right? So what about, do we regulate window signs? We don't now. No, no. not okay. beyond. So, so that's the line we're drawing that if, if it's inside a contained structure, we don't count it. Is that right? Right. right. Yeah. What okay. if it's a freestanding sandwich Because that, that violates the definition, because you can still see a, a sign on a window from a street. Right. So I don't, I don't know how we came up with that. So if we're being inconsistent, I, you know, that's... Well, but know. they weren't doing it back when we wrote those Well, rules. it does say in the definition, I believe it says um, out, lo located outdoors. Does? Okay. How are made displayed intended for use of purpose? When located out of doors. Okay. There we go. I, I don't know. I think that's what it says. Whether we should change it, we probably should. Maybe we should. But if it's located out of doors and visible from the street or from any other lot. So I haven't put it behind a window or where I, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I get your dilemma and I, and I get what it's, I, I think that's what it says, right? Am I missing? And, and, and we probably, I don't know. My take on it, I have a <clears throat> building permit that I'm reviewing right now, so I just wanted to get your take on it um, before I made a decision, particularly since it's not gonna be one that applicants pleased with. Um, but it, 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 in this case, it happens to be a branding type sign, and their way around it's going to be to not put the sign on it, the actual writing on it. So it'll just be a architectural feature on the property. Because they've used up their allotted signage You're elsewhere? You only have one pole sign on the property, and I wouldn't count it as directional signage or anything like that that's spoken to separately. So, yeah, I mean, I. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> is, it, is there a, a difference between an advertisement and a sign that something gets put in someone's window and stays there maybe a month? Uh, I, I'm just going to use Joe's example. You go to these, these uh, gas stations mm -hmm. and they're plastered with cigarette advertisements. Are they signs? I don't, I don't think they are. I, I, I think they look terrible, by the way, but I, I don't think they're signs, though. I think there's a difference between advertisement and signs. The, well, <clears throat> if, if they're behind, behind the window, it. it's one thing, but if they're outside of the window, intended for the purpose of advertisement, <laughs> identification, publicity, or notice. Well, what I'm saying, Joe, is that the, the, and I agree with you, all my point is, is that that piece of paper is not a sign. It, in my mind, the sign is something permanently attached to a building. A, taking a, an advertisement whether it's on the inside or the outside, it's still an advertisement, but it's not a sign. So is an A-frame a sign? 
Well, yeah, I think mm -hmm. it is. But it's not I think permanent. it's different. Well, if, if, because it's really a permanent, you know, I, I owned a retail store at one time, and, and we would get uh, advertisements all the time that you can put in your window, put on your door. Well, yeah, like for like plays and things yeah, like that, to, uh, you know, in so, advance. I mean, yeah, those. Things that were uh, less than 30 days, let's say, were considered advertisement. Something that was attached to your building or f a, a physical structure, a, a, a window sign, whether it's on the inside or outside, uh, it might be a technical point, but it, it's really not a sign. It's really just advertisements. And I, I don't think there's any answer to the question, by the way. I think you can drive yourself nuts with it, but, but I, I just thought that there, yeah. there's a difference between when, when a company who's trying to sell you something gives a retailer, hey, here's something that's got a, a special, you can get 12 packs of cigarettes for, I don't know, a dollar. Well, how is that any different than a clothing store having a window display of their clothes? Or, you know, I mean, it's they're advertising their merchandise just like you know, the cigarette ad is yeah, trying to advertise the merchandise or the realtors try to advertise their products. Yeah. You know, so But but it's not permanent though. If someone's having a well, sale it's changed, and they yeah. put a sign in their window and it says, you know, sixty percent off this clothing store, it's different than the sign that's hanging outside the the building. Well it behooves you to change time. your window display to attract customers. Well the good news and if it's Coco's inside does a we don't great regulate. job of it. <laughs> 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 I mean, the distinction between signage that are for customers or whatever internally in, in, in your yeah. and that would be my compared to a sign that is you're trying to draw from the road. You can drive the bike. You're trying to draw from off the property. Well, right. off the property. Sign. Signage inside the property that whatever they're selling, mostly it's outside goods, whatever they're selling, that's internal. That's that that should even be considered that a sign. Right. That's well, internal use. Yeah, it sounds like that's the consensus. So why don't maybe we can do two things? One is um, I'm hearing that the wording that's there right now, if it's visible, it's a sign. Visible is visible. If it's outside, hand, and it's we, visible, right. and it's a sign. It's a sign. It's a sign. Right. <laughs> and on the other hand, we ought to look at some way to change the regulation, possibly to exclude signage that's really directed to people that are interior already on a piece of property. <clears throat> using the business or whatever it is and like a gas station right at the pump and there's right. a little thing that's selling something and okay there they drove in they're subject to the that advertising they're sort of signing up for that pardon the pun um uh. ha -ha. <laughs> and that th that wouldn't be necessarily be a sign whatever you know display is on the pump itself that can't really it's not really directed towards people outside of the property that are traveling on the street Sure. Does that make sense? Am I hearing that right? Yeah, but those signs yeah. you're, you're talking about, those are people that are already there. Right. You're not trying to, right. not trying to track people in. Right. Yeah, signs still, out on the road is what you're trying yeah. to bring people into your... Into but, your right. Yeah, I just think right. you have a right to advertise and, and the distinction between the name of your establishment versus your product of the establishment or what you're, you know, I see the product as like a transition to draw people in. Yeah, it's almost and, like you're in the grocery right. store and you see those old things at the end of the aisle and they're trying to sell well, you whatever Or even it is. outside yeah, the grocery store, inside. the pumpkins, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you yeah. know, it's. Yeah. All right, so. You know, it's. Does that make sense for the purpose of tonight? Yep. I could say that and then we'll look at some way to change the definition so it follows what I get taking the consensus of the commission yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah, explore that. I think it would be interesting. I would I'd like to see if anyone else has developed that. Yeah, yeah, we'll do a okay. little scout around. You know, also, sort of, uh, just thinking about it, but, you know, allow people that have temp and temporary signs, right? retail people that yeah. want to have, have a sale on something. I yeah, mean, we used to have a section for that, and it was taken out of the regs for some reason, so we're actually looking at, we may come back to you and try to propose putting that back in the regs. Something's yeah. got to be, you know, yeah. for, you know, you've got people that, that they have, you know, right. a they sale have things. on something or an item or seasonal things or whatever it might be. Yeah. You, know, you, you need to advertise for having something without going through uh, all the hoops and everything. Problems yeah. to get a, yeah. a permit to do a 30 day sign or a one week sign or a sale or something. Yep. Yeah, we have to, we got to be, be reasonable. reasonable and be fair yep. to, the, to the business people, yep. the owners. Sure. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. And there's another one. Right? Yeah, okay. so the second Sorry. one is about basements. There's no definition of basement in the regulations. 
but um, section 6.2F covers um, floor area and the floor area ratio. Um, so basements are excluded from the floor area ratio calculation, but they are counted towards the parking requirements. So my question is, um, is there a point where a basement is no longer a basement? If it's a walkout basement, is it still treated as a basement as far as being excluded from the calculation of the ratio of floor area or? If the lower level's being used, then it, it, it then needs parking to accommodate it. So the parking is. So if it, you see what I'm saying? Like. Yeah, so let me just clarify. So the basement mm -hmm. area is excluded from the floor area ratio, so the allowed floor area on the property, but it's still counted towards the parking. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so it's still, it's still counted for parking purposes. It just would be taken out from the floor area, the maximum floor but area. But in the allowed. case where it's not the finished space, then you're having excess parking. It, it's, yeah. it's, you know, the, it's sort of a catch-22. What is the question, is anything living area, should be that be a basement, or what do you mean? So, it, we don't have the definition of basement. It doesn't speak to whether it's finished or being used for any sort of use or anything. Um, the question, I guess, is if a property has a basement that is above ground more than perhaps your typical it's not it's not surrounded completely on like all walk sides. Out. you could walk out in the back or you might have to walk up a couple of steps to get out but it's not like a raised ranch like yeah. a raised ranch yeah. would be basement or it could be like a commercial level. property where the front is higher than the lowers yeah. the grade still um what, what would it count towards the floor area does it the issue really to my mind is the calculation the basis of the calculation of square footage because that, that we're, we're hitting like a, a bunch of my pet peeves in, in the ordinance and the inconsistency in the use of terminology for calculation, calculating area compared to the many of the contemporary standards for calculating area is, is a little off and it's a little peculiar to the, to the, um, the zoning ordinance. And Rather than de defining the basement, or giving a basement a definition is not going to help it in terms of its relationship to calculating the floor area ratio. And it's not going to help in terms of the further clarification of gross and net square footage. But at some point it might be helpful to get a definition of a basement. I'm not sure if, you know, why a dictionary definition would not suffice unless we have some special regulatory mission for a basement. Um, that's there is beyond a, the building code. Yeah, well there is a couple of different things, but there's a definition in a standard reference manual that the zoning regulations refer to the commission to, the illustrated book of zoning definitions. Um, which I think that's the excerpt. Yeah, everyone has a copy of that as well. Oh. Well, you can take five. I, I would probably go with this definition unless the, I'm trying to think what the con the context then is floor area ratio, right? Is, is that it? Because you're not worried about parking? Because right, parking's already addressed. Parking's it's addressed. Just as far as the floor area ratio goes. So um, where is, I'm, I'm and, and that's in commercial concerns. stuff and that we don't use that so much in residential or I what? I mean, it, it right. would apply to residential as well. Multifamily? Uh, I think it, yeah. It would apply to a single family house as well, as yeah. far as the floor area. Yeah, so um, but it's usually not a problem. Okay. But yeah, it's usually not. Okay, so it's how much of a, it's a limit of how much of a building you can put on a site. This, this is what the impact is. Because right. if you include the basement, then you may not be able to have as big a building. And if you don't, eh, so the question is what, and we exclude, we exclude or we include basements in floor area ratio? Uh, basements exclude. are excluded from the They're excluded, floor. so yeah. that means you can functionally have a basement that mm -hmm. operates just like a first floor, but even, you know. Or have that, a use or be a finished whatever. space. Is that a way around it? But I, I would go, we use the term basement, and I would probably go with whatever standard definition is. If we've got a, appealed or whatever, that's what a judge would do. That's how we'd win the case by going, relying on common dictionary or standard definitions. If we need to change it, 
maybe we should. And I, I don't know how other, I mean, we can't be the only town that has, has this issue either. Or, or are we? I don't know. I'm I don't not know. sure how other towns yeah, have Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's another thing you can look at if we don't, yeah. and whatever our precedent is, what our, how we've interpreted it in the past. Yeah. From my understanding, it sounds like in the past there has been some interpretation that if it's a walkout basement, it might count towards floor area. But when I started looking at definitions, um, I mean, it's saying a space having one half or more of its floor to ceiling height above the average level of the adjoining grade. So to me, that doesn't really speak to whether or not, but then that you get into it more, and some, some do speak to that. And I think if you look, read more into this comment, it also speaks to it as well, that perhaps if you know one side is walk out, then it might be different. If, so. if there is a, his, a, a consistent history of having interpreted it a certain way, I would probably, unless that's off the wall, I would probably stick with it, but, but I don't. I'm not sure. I don't know yeah, if I'm there not is. Sure if it's consistent, but I'll dig into that a bit more right. and see what I can find. Because that's there's that perception as well. Hey, why are you treat me differently than someone else and whatever you know? Yeah. You know, and if it's if it's reasonable, it's not off the wall. Then I would that the default would be to stick with what you, the way it's been interpreted in the past. I don't. Know. Is that enough? Is that <laughs> yeah. Enough? Okay. I'll I'll try and find out more about what the history of the application has been. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. And say, so just please do not use the definition that, that came in this handout for a space having one half or more of its floor to ceiling height above the average level of the adjoining ground with a floor to ceiling height. Not like, I mean, please don't use that. <laughs> you, you cannot draw that. Okay. Okay, item number three. We got what? Okay, item number three, we have a request for a bond establishment for 199 Linden Avenue. Um, I have a memo from, uh, from Jamie. Um, the contractor on the properties requests the acceptance of a bond in lieu of completing uh, the lawn establishment in order to expedite getting a CO. Um, the time of year is really Can't plan hot it. weather. It's not good to start, try to do it now. So uh, the estimate is $1,500. Um, and uh, the memo concludes that it's considered sufficient to cover the uh, the outstanding site work. So Motion to establish a $1,500 dollar bond for 199 Linden Avenue for lawn establishment yes yes someone make that so moved by John second second Joe for the discussion all in favor all right okay okay what's the 824 the 824 is um, for extension of sewer on Riverview Avenue uh, I think the sewer line currently goes down a bit of it there are several properties adjacent to the farm river that are either on holding tanks or on uh, septics and uh, the proposal is to extend sewer all the way down the remainder of Riverview Avenue and pick up these sort of in darker shade tone properties and some of them would have to hook up and a few would have the option to hook up. Yeah, so help we'll offset the, report. Does that help offset the expense of it? Well, yeah, it's required by the ordinance um, and um, it would help deal with water quality issues in the Farm River and mm. adjacent portion of Long Island Sound. Good. Questions? Is there a motion to positively refer, uh, give a positive 824 referral for the extension of the sewer line for Riverview Avenue? So moved. Motion made by sec. For discussion? All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so that passes. Main Street overlay, you, said you gave us stuff. Yeah, I gave you a uh, cleaned up version to reflect all the discussion at the last meeting, so if you're happy with that, um, we can move it to a public hearing. Yeah, I'll look it over with you too. And we'll talk about right, it before it actually comments, goes. emails. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I have nothing further to say in the planner's report. Great. <laughs> okay. So I think we'll have a special meeting just probably for the other thing, for the uh, Whitewood. I call it the Whitewood uh, School. Yeah. Right. The, school. the Nest School. The Nest. Uh, on August 12th. I may or may not make it. So. Okay. So is there a motion to adjourn? Same. Same. And then. Uh, second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Otherwise, we can set up. This program was brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings and other videos on demand at brantfordtv.org.